let's get this project started for today. So here's what I'm doing. I'm working on the story engine and I've been going through iterations on the story machine. What I mean by the story machine is it feels to me like I need something like a computation model in this project, or at least that's the way I'm approaching it still because I want to build these story graphs and then I want to have a thing which sits on them and, and, and simulates them or runs them. And I want that thing to have some fairly sophisticated properties. I want that thing to be able to hook into game logic and say like, okay, run this bit of game logic, run this bit of game logic as you make decisions through the story. And I also want to be able to do things like using the, the, the structure, the discrete topology of the graph to uh, automate things like figuring out what paths are available to the player uh, and things like that. And so I've been toying with different structures for how, how to make that work. And uh, I have a new idea in mind, which I've kind of like sketched out here uh, before the weekend. And so here on Monday, I want to actually build out the story engine machine, the, the story machine for the engine that is proposed by this header file, basically. So this header file, it's not hooked into the real project yet, uh, but it's like a proposition that I wrote for myself. My last step in the weekend was to say like, okay, last week's idea, I, I was able to build um, this tree thing. If you'll recall, I did like a story cell tree thing. And I got that up and running to the point where I could build the story tree things, but they, they, they were, there were trees in the way that like you have a syntax tree, right? I was sort of modeling the syntax and attaching things on as syntax trees. And then I was going to try to run an interpreter right on top of that. Well, it turns out that that was actually a much bigger ask than I expected. I thought, I thought that by skipping the, the translation step, I was making it easier. So my thought process was put a high level thing in place and instead of inter like translating that to a graph and then running the graph on the machine, let's just write an interpreter that looked at the tree. Uh, that turned out to be way harder than I thought it would be. Uh, uh, graph algorithms that need to do things like walking edges, when those edges aren't organized into a single place but are sort of syntactically attached in certain places, uh, that's pretty tricky and uh, confusing. So I backed off from that idea and said, okay, instead of starting at the high level syntax and writing an interpreter on that, what if I think about, let's not think about what the interface, like I, I have an idea, I think the interface that I've proposed is right or something close to that is right. So then I boiled that down to its simplest computational blocks. So basically if I was gonna have a translation, what would be the m m tiny atoms that, that that translation would put it on, would, would output, right? What would be the the um, the bytecode on the virtual machine or the intermediate representation, you might call it, although it's not intermediate because I want to actually run, for now I want to run the virtual machine on the intermediate representation directly. In fact, I might always want that. So it's really not an IR. It is the, it is the data structure that defines a program for this particular machine. So what is the data structure I have in mind? Well, in this in this model, let me give you an intro to the model. Uh, we're gonna have a graph and it's a directed graph. So we have edges and we have, I'm calling them nodes here. I could call it these paths actually. I think I would like that better. Right, so I have nodes and paths. And um, your nodes can, uh, you know, there'll be different kinds of nodes. Right now I just haven't entered an exit node, but there'll be different kinds of nodes for doing different kinds of things. Um, so we can see right here, I actually have a couple other kinds of nodes already proposed. So we can fill that out. What, when the machine is executing, I'm no longer gonna say, let's attach code to the nodes and to the paths or to the states and the paths. Like before I was saying, hey, we have this graph, we attach code to different parts of it. And then we have a machine that looks at that thing and runs the code on it. Then I tried to simplify it to, let's just look at a high level thing where we don't think about attaching the code and we just use the graph structure and do kind of like node wire programming all the way. And like I said, running the interpreter on that, that was feeling like a disaster. So now I'm thinking, let's go the opposite direction. Let's start with the original idea and make it even more low level building blocks. So instead of having arbitrary amounts of code attached to each vertex in each edge of the graph, 
Now there will only be code attached to the nodes and the nodes can only have a finite amount of code on them. They have basically one instruction or one, um, one point, whatever that will mean. An instruction might kind of be the right idea, except that there will be in quote unquote instructions that are effectively no ops, but the direct behaviors um, in ways that don't translate to an instruction. Um, so they're like these atoms of computation. And then if you need to do a bunch of them in a single chain, you just will chain them together. The paths themselves will not have computation on them. And what will happen is if you want to just straight line code, then that's just like writing, that's just the graph that looks like this, right? You just have a node and then here, let me, let me do this right. So the, 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 the structure is like this, right? We have a path and then a node and a path and a node and a path over and over again. So that right there would be a straight line program. Um, if you wanted to, you could throw in branches then, right? So you can have like a branch, which then goes like, oh, let's do uh, something like this and like loops back up to find another node uh, earlier or later or something. Uh, so like this kind of thing, right? So you could have a branch and you have two things come out here and a thing, uh, you know, a, this node can be reached by two places. You're seeing this is more like um, basic. So if this is our each a piece of computation and then this is a branch and this is a branch because it lets you go this way or that way. Uh, and then there's some other ideas in here. So like, how will this become more than just a low level computation model that I'm playing with? How, why bother to building one of these? Because once I've, so one, one thing to watch out for is just because I have one of these doesn't mean I have the ability to solve my problem, right? I still have to encode the solution to my problem into this. But the point is that not that I think this by itself is more convenient. The, the missing piece that I haven't shown you yet is that there's this other kind of instruction called a fork and then a verb. And so a fork is different from a, um, a fork is different from a, uh, branch because forks will be used to create, uh, forks will end on these things called verbs and they create this sort of non-deterministic computation path. So it could look like this. For instance, I'm not quite sure. Um, right. Right. And so with a with this, what happens is if you reach a fork, now the computation model will do something fancy. And this is be where the thing happens that makes it uh, the interactive fiction story machine and not just some arbitrary in, uh, intermediate representation for a compiler or something. Here, what the machine does is it goes, okay, we have reached a non-deterministic chunk of code. Every path leaving a fork, there can be an unbounded number of them, any number of them. Every path leaving a fork ends, uh, goes forward and like ends when it finds a verb. So verbs sort of fork knows the transition from what you might color these, right? So you can say like, this is black code here. This is a regular old deterministic code. And this is green code. It's non-deterministic. And this green code um, begins with a fork. And then the graph that follows from a fork is all green until you find a verb and the verb transitions from green back to black. So this is be black code and uh, this would be black code, right? Um, right. So all of this would be black code here. And then this is the green code here. So the machine's job is to run like a normal virtual machine on this little IR graph thing until it reaches a fork. And when it reaches a fork, it stops there and looks ahead down all of its paths simultaneously. Well, it looks about down, it can't, it doesn't need to be literally simultaneously, but before the user sees something has happened, it will look down all these paths and gather up all the different ways it can reach a verb. And then that list of verbs becomes our, our verbs for the interface in the uh, story engine that the user then, whether the user is literally a player on the 
interactive text game or if it's a higher level part of the game engine somehow it decides out of those verbs which one to use or it uses them to create the interactive uh, experience somehow right and then it uh, the point being once it's done this it, it is waiting for the outside thing whatever the whatever the out whatever is happening outside of the machine is going to decide which of these verbs uh, to actually take and so once one of those gets selected it then heads down the path to that verb and then continues from that verb onward so this is a no-op and this is a no-op from the perspective of it doesn't it doesn't do any um, what's the word I'm looking for it doesn't do anything uh, uh, to the state of the machine other than like you know obviously the state of which node you're on changes as you execute but it doesn't do anything to variables or any uh, stack or anything like that all it does do is note the beginning and ends of these non-deterministic paths. And then the idea is that in between, um, there could be opportunities for computation of another kind, right? So we could do in between computations. There's also an idea of like, hey, maybe sometimes you wanna do something like branch here with the possibility of ending at like a dead end, so like blocked. So like this verb, the block would similarly end the look ahead by the fork. So we starting at this fork, we go ahead and if we went down this path, we'd see, oh, we're blocked. Then there's no verb for going this way. This is a dead end. And so if a fork is blocked in every direction, it's just a dead end uh, entirely. But, uh, and that, that might be a problem, but, but not in the sense of that it's a problem we need to avoid allowing in the compute model. It's a problem in the sense that the game needs to be structured so that that doesn't happen. But uh, the point is, you know, you can look ahead and see here and go like, okay, if we take this verb, then there is some side effect along the way. And if we go this way, then there's some state check here. So these things, these kinds of things can still happen here in the non-deterministic section. And you just have to be careful not to do anything that leads to full, being fully blocked or an infinite loop inside of the f one of the forked paths or something. Um, and a part of what's interesting here is like if we run down this path and this does a change of state, like it changes some memory or some variables or whatever, then we later look down this path, this should not see this changes of state that happened here. This is a change of state that only happens if we take this path, right? So the non-determinism that kicks in here means that if we go down this path, the change in state here applies to taking this path. It does not apply to taking any other path. So we need some kind of way to say like, hey, when we're when we're uh, at a fork, save our current state and run each path forward until we've reached a, the the blocking point or the you know the end of the fork in every direction, and gather up the verbs from that. But as we go down each of the separate paths of the fork, we need to restore that state that we saved here, right? So that's what the fork and the verb and the block will do. Okay, so that's the goal. That's what we're building. Now, I have a little interface plan for how to specify these things. These are low level, so this will not be a convenient interface uh, to program the whole game in. The idea is that this is a low level thing and I will end up, end up making something else higher level that translates down to this. But to get started, I thought I should have some way to specify out these graphs just so I can build little test graphs and, and run tests on those rather than trying to write the whole game at the high level and then try to figure out how to run that. I'm saying, okay, I have a good idea of what the low level needs to look like. Let's build up the data structures and the machine that I need there. And so I just need to be able to create some test data. So that's what this here is for. So the node thing here creates one of these nodes, right? The flow call here, which gets wrapped in this macro here, just says, hey, create a path. Why don't we call that a path instead of a flow?
and um, okay. So this creates a path from this position to this position. Now there are rules, right? If we look like uh, the the nodes I had before, if you know, if you're a if you're a regular node, you're only supposed to have one outgoing path. So this thing doesn't prevent you from putting in lots of extra paths, right? There's a possibility of having like one regular old node has three paths coming out. That's wrong. It's not supposed to have zero. It's not supposed to have two or more. It's supposed to have exactly one. Uh, depending on what kind of node you have, the rules on how many paths come in and out are different. So like an entrance node, an enter node, should have no paths coming into it. An enter node is supposed to be... Um, uh, sort of entered from outside. So the exit node similarly should have no paths coming out from it. The um, the branch node should have two paths coming out from it. The fork node should have any number of paths coming out from it. The verb node should have one path coming out from it and so on and so on and so on, right? Um, so we, what we probably want to do is set up this thing that lets me freely construct paths and then throw in a check just to make sure, um, you know, just, I think that'd be a good place to get started is just say, hey, let's put down a spot where we write down the rules about paths that enter and leave each node kind uh, and write those rules down as code that actually can run and tell us if the rules have been violated. So this is what we're building. Let's start by uh, going in here and exposing the new code into the k program. Oh, I have two different things building right now. We don't need sync writer. Thank you. All right, so that worked. And let's add in a new story machine file for implementing this. Program construction functions. Now the node constructor should be pretty easy. We get our kind from right there. We get our data from right there. The rest stays empty at first. This gets filled up as we attach paths. Now the path constructor is also pretty easy, but a little more interesting. The path constructor needs to insert the path onto its source side. So the way I'm structuring this, according to the plan I made at least, and maybe I don't wanna keep it this way, but the way I'm structuring it is, each node contains within it a list of the outgoing paths and each path contains within it the pointer to the destination node. So the path structure, this path like struct doesn't know where it came from. It doesn't know its source side. So having one of these by itself, by itself is useless unless all you need is the destination. But it knows its destination side. And so what these are basically doing is saying when you're on a node, 
it's easy to look to where you're going. It's not as easy to figure out who's coming into you. If you're doing a whole graph analysis, that's less important. But if you're doing something like a, the machine implementation and you wanted to look backwards, that would not be something you could do on this data structure. I think that that will be fine. But if not, it's also not that hard to say like, hey, let's, let's have each path live on both sides and keep track of both ends. So it would double the size of this and it would mean there were two lists because these are the first, these are the outgoing paths we could have. You could imagine like, right? This would be the out path and this would be the in path, right? And so the incoming paths would get, we'd have like an out next and in next. So each path note struct could be threaded through two different linked lists. And then this, right? So this would be the transformation. We'd have almost doubled our node and almost doubled our path size. Um, but that way we can transition to having a solution to that in that direction if it turns out to matter and then the constructors will still just work for building it okay so the path count needs to go up and then the path has its destination so that should be how we construct our path so there's our implementation the macros do the rest, and then this here should be able to go and live over here as like, let's say, um, these want uh, an, an SM builder, so let's do SM builder, SM builder equals uh, SM builder allocate. And then we get all these notes or all this, we get all this here. What I ultimately need though, so the other thing I probably want to do is as I'm building this, I probably want to keep track of all the nodes that I create. Um, that could be something like this. Um, yeah, I could do something funky. I think I'll do it this way. have here a list of the entrances to the um, graph that we built. And then whenever we add a node, if the node is an enter node, Then we just create node reference. And we set that node reference to point at our node and we queue it up. And now it's just complaining because I'm using kinds of nodes that don't actually exist in the list yet. So we want a show and a verb and a fork and a wire. And this needs to return the node. Okay. By the way, here's the new interface. So what happens now is the, the, I mean, there's no text coming out from the system yet. I have obliterated all of my content, but it's more like a log now. So um, as you're reading, the new stuff you read uh, shows up at the bottom and you can scroll through everything you've seen so far. And um, if there's ever a time when there's a more interesting decision to make, 
instead of saying continue, it'll put the whole uh, like set of options for your decision here. But then after you make that decision, those options disappear and just the results remain. Let's just uh, make sure to namespace things properly. Even though it makes the names a little longer, it's just what we're going to want in the long run. Okay. So now what we want to do is we want to have it Yeah, what is sim run doing right now? This is right here where it would run the story machine and get results back for the new output text and the new verb text. Um, so I think what needs to happen is We need to keep the builder here in the app state. Okay. Okay. So when we begin a run, we'll do SM start. And so when, it, when I tell it to start, what'll happen? Well, we don't actually have a story machine yet, but what we do have is the SM builder. So the one thing we'll be able to do is say, okay, get us the, get us the builder and um, now what I wanna do is think what's the, 
So I guess the first thing I want to do is before I go any farther than this, like to do, we'll, we'll do this. Where I wanted to land was somewhere to check the final result. So let's do... Something like that. And let's go write the check. I'm trying to think if I don't necessarily want this to be as an assert. I might want it to be a little more. <laughs> uh, Leonian, it's a great question. Or Leonilian. Uh, too many I's and L's next to each other. I can't quite keep it straight in my head. But um, hi, I. Uh, I don't mind the question at all, and yeah, I do think talking out loud is kind of like, it is nice for some kinds of things. It, it is, so here's the thing, uh, programming with text like this uses a lot of linguistic brain, and so having a certain chunk of my brain allocated to talking about what I'm doing, I think lowers the... Um, the amount of spare room I have for thinking through really hard things. So if I was doing something um, that required a lateral move, like if I was doing something that would require rearranging my language, it would not be so easy to do that on the stream. However, if I know what my plan is and it's just a matter of cranking through all the details, talking out loud to the stream helps a lot. So like, I, I think something that would be really hard to do on stream well would be renaming things or refactoring, uh, designing a new factorization, but actually executing on a plan for refactoring once you have it straight in your head helps a lot to just talk out loud. I'm trying to think if I want to do the check as return a Boolean that's yes or no, or if I want to have it return messages and stuff. And if I'm going to do have it return messages, would I want to have it just put those onto the error system? That could be pretty convenient. I already have error accumulation happening at that point. So yeah, this could just be like, hey, we'll return true or false. So you can get a false if it's not in good shape. But also, we will emit errors from this. This will be a good opportunity to show why I like the error check or the error organization system uh, that I have. Um, put this down here. So what we can do, since this is gonna communicate with the error system, is I can tell it to begin accumulation here. I can tell it to end accumulation here. And The reason for that is so that I can then say, if we had an error somewhere in there, then if, if we had no error string come out inside this block, then that is the equivalent of saying there was no error. So I can check this range for an error. And then what I can do is I think it's just going to be error emit the error string again. So 
So basically the idea is I begin error accumulation here. So I've contained all the errors that I'm gonna emit inside of a separate block. When I end accumulation, that lets me check the error, do something locally with it and kick it up the chain. So I can locally decide whether or not this function returns true or false. And I can say like, hey, if there's already somebody else who's deciding what to do with errors, this function doesn't want to say like errors get printed when they happen or errors get logged when they happen, but it wants to see what errors it has emitted. And then it'll let, if there's an, it'll say I also allow a, another handler deeper in the stack to see the same thing that I saw. Chat in the chat says, talking out loud engages the system two of the brain, which is slower than system one, but is more accurate. System one is used for automatic or subconscious tasks, but is very fast. Yeah, that makes sense. That, that lines up with what I was saying. I, I don't know about system one and two. I haven't heard that. I don't know if, it, uh, if that's like the thinking slow and fast thing or, or what what uh, literature that comes from uh, in terms of the functioning of the brain in neuroscience. But uh, in terms of my own experience of, of, of what they're like, uh, what it's like to talk on stream versus what it's like to program in quiet and what sort of problems are suited to those different settings, that, um, that matches up. Yeah, Thinking Fast and Slow. I've, I've got that book on my shelf. I haven't read it yet, but I it sounded kind of like that might be the since you were talking about some, you know, a slow kind of thinking and a fast kind of thinking, I wondered if that was where it came from. I'll have to bump that up the priority list. Um, now that it's come back into my attention. Okay. So how do we want to check this? Well, I have, I have, I have a couple ways I could think about checking it. I could say that in order to check it, I need to scan every node and look at all the paths in every node. The hard thing with that is that all, yeah, I think all I want to do is check that locally the rules are followed as they leave from each node. The problem with that is I don't have a list of all nodes here. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just simplify this. Earlier I was saying we would just keep a list of all of the entrance nodes, but let's just change that to saying we keep a list of all the nodes. So in addition to creating a graph, we create a list of all the nodes. Then to check it is just a matter of going, okay, look through each of these. And for each one, we're gonna look at the node on it. We're gonna switch on that nodes. Uh, let's see, so there are rules about incoming paths and there are rules about outgoing paths. Okay, the, the rules about outgoing paths are easy to check here. What are the rules about incoming paths? Well, the only rule about incoming paths is that the entrance nodes shouldn't have incoming paths. So we should never see an enter inside of the dest of a path. And besides that, everything else we wanna check is about, given the, what kind of node we are, how many paths should we have? All right, I'm gonna start by saying expect path count is gonna be a max u64, which is gonna be a special symbol for meaning un, 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 in particular. It can be anything between zero and, and max u64. Everything else, if I give you a zero or a one or a two, that's how many paths you should have. Then what I'll do is I'll switch on the nodes kind and look at each of these. Kind of like this, 
So Fork is out of this game because Fork actually should go with the Max U64. So I guess for that, what I'll do is I'll just, I'll keep it in the list and I'll say no restriction. Um, but that way it's nice to have it in the list still so that I can do something like, you know, keep this in order with this over time and make sure I have covered all my paths and that all everything lines up. So wire, yeah, show, yeah, what, verb, yeah. Okay, so those are the ones we have so far. Later on, if we add branches, there might be one with two in there. If we add blocks, there might be one with one or zero in there again. Um, by the way, enter and exit, something we don't have yet is we don't have function calls. Uh, but I think we wanna have function calls and then enter and exit would actually mean enter is the spot where a function call begins and exit is like a return. So that's why exit has a zero there. It's the end of the graph, which can mean from the perspective of, if this, of this being an isolated function on a call stack, it is a return node. Uh, this is not Vim or Emacs, this is Forkoder. Forkoder project. Actually, why is my project named test? That's lame. Let's call this the Mr. Fork project. Okay. Anyway. There we go. Project Mr. Fourth. Cool. If you want to see more about Forkoder, Forkoder.net has it all. Um, Forkoder has keyboard macros. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was a keyboard macro. So I, I like, when I go into macro mode, you can see it like makes my cursor orange so that I know I'm recording and then I do whatever I want and then I can replay that. And it just, it, all it's doing there is re-simulating the same keyboard input. So it's actually, if we go over here, there's a log buffer and the log buffer remembers, um, this isn't the right one. It's not the log buffer that I want. It's the keyboard buffer. Yeah. So you go through the keyboard buffer. It remembers, it's got this funny looking text file that just remembers all the keys you've pressed while you've, um, while you've had the program open, while Forkoder's been open. And so then it can take a range of lines and replay those as inputs to trigger all the same uh, behaviors. It mostly works. There are a couple times like where if you did something with a mouse, that doesn't translate because the keyboard list doesn't, uh, doesn't have that info. And the, the reason it's cool that it's in a, a buffer like that is if you're making your own customizations for Forkoder, then you can do other things. Like my recording system is just what's built in, but you could imagine going in there and saving separate ranges and being like, here's a macro, here's a macro, here's a macro, and just keeping them around. You could build your own uh, buffer that is not the keyboard buffer, but is just contains copies of things you like. And so you can, if you have the text that represents the key presses that you want to simulate somewhere, then your customization can use that text. And then the key, uh, the key buffer is just a special one that records each key press all the time so that you can record literal inputs when they happen and do whatever you want with them. Anyway, um, once we have our expect path count, if that is less than max u64, then if the node path count does not equal the expected path count, Um, yeah, so Forkoder is very Emacs, um, Emacs like it's, e it's sort of inspired by Emacs, but it is stripped down, really focused on 
C and C++ and uh, similar languages and not anything else. You can like make raw text files in it, but you can see like the virtual white space system, for instance, that just like automatic, it's not just auto indenting, it's like automatically putting things in the correct wrapping without, without any, like I can't, if I hit backspace, it just does that, right? Uh, the virtual white space just means you never have to run a command to redo the indentation. It's constantly laying things out uh, and completely hiding the, like you can't even try. You can't, I can't press spaces here, backspaces. They don't, there's nothing I can do to make it not laid out correctly. Um, okay, so if the path count on the node doesn't match the expected path count, um, then I want to emit an error. And I'm going to say something like, enough outgoing paths at And then I need uh, to expand the node's dev label, which I realize does not exist, but we'll fix that. And if the path count is too big, too many outgoing paths at dev label. Okay, so the idea of dev label there is just like, hey, while we're in development mode, let's put a string here so that when I um, make a node, I can attach a dev label. A straight push copy. Builder arena dev label. So we push a copy of the dev label and then we will say this thing here, it's got an N which is the local variable name. Let's just have it automatically take the local variable name and treat that also as the dev label. So that'll mean that um, we'll have names like enter and And enter F, no, 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 thief, wire, exit, right? So these things here become the dev labels. And you can see I also have these strings attached here. I could go with that, those as the dev labels, I suppose. But the problem with that would be some of these are, I don't know. Maybe I could do that. I mean, eventually what's going to happen is these are supposed to be well, for, okay, for one thing, these wouldn't necessarily be unique, right? If I, if I start having things like, you know, um, this, right, that would be very poor a poor way to try to figure out which line I was actually on or which node I was actually on. So instead of having to go with that, then it would be X1. That would still not be unique, but it would be unique within its context, right? So for instance, if I see thief and then wire, I'm going to be able to know that that's this wire based on the names. Now I could go with these for now, but I think I think dev labels will be better. And then, you know, the combination of the two will be nice to have uh, as well, probably. So Forcoder has, I can turn off the virtual white space. And then it's like a standard text buffer 
with you know the ability to do indentation. So I can do like mess up the text like you could in any other text editor, and then as a command tell it to do layout. And that's just like a standard um, formatter. Like that can be that can be any text rewrite rule that you want it to be basically. Any anything that any text editor could do can happen there. But when I turn virtual white space on, um, what's actually happening is it is scanning the buffer, like it's not doing it all the time, it's incrementally, but it is scanning and parsing the buffer and keeping track of the number of pixels that should be used for indentation on each line given the syntax rules. And so even if I, so you can see right here, I'm on column five. If I press space a bunch, that's going up. I am inserting spaces. And if I turn off virtual white space, you will see that. Now, when I save, with this off, like virtual white space off, it saves that weirdness. But what happens with virtual white space on is if I save, um, it will automatically do the indentation to make it. So, so it's hiding away the fact that, that the text level indentation is some goofy thing. Now what's cool about this is say you're on a team where the rule is that indentation is four spaces and you're like me where you like really shallow indent so that you can fit more on each line. So I do like one space indents visually for myself, but the team wants four space indents. Well, I can just say like, fine, my text indenter will automatically do four space indents. And then my virtual white space layouting engine lays it out the way I want it to look. And so I interact with it like this. And I also like when I hit backspace here, it understands that it treats this as the beginning of a line. Yeah, so it's it's a little bit of a departure from a standard text editor in that one space spot, which is that it it uh, is creating a little bit of a it's a very thin but a slight interface onto the text that is um, going through like layout layouting. So it's not a full on word processor with with a bunch of stuff. But the other cool stuff about virtual white space is like, okay, um, say again the the the. Um, the rules say that you have to do your braces like that. Well, it, it doesn't have any magic for that. It can't make it look like this when really you mean that because it only applies to that white space at the beginning of lines. So there's no magic for making a new line not look like a new line. That would be cool, but I think that maybe it's a bit much to ask for from, from an underlying text file. I, I, I haven't really thought of a way that that would ever happen um, without, without causing bigger problems than it's worth. Um, but at the limit, there are things like, um, like, like parentheses alignment that just can be automatic. So if I tur turn off the virtual white space, if the team doesn't do this kind of thing, right? If their preference for indentation would be that you do, I, I, don't, I don't know what people might do. I'm trying to think of what's a good case of where people do parentheses a little different. Um, so like if you're doing int x equals and then you have some really long complicated thing you have to do right and it's like getting long here there might be people who would not want the the new line to line up like this they might say like no no no. when it goes down um let's see i gotta turn virtual white space off there we go and then say like oh please line it up like 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 this or something right like one, two, three, four, line it up like an indentation and brackets. Now my, my text indenter isn't set up for that either right now, but you could imagine having your text indenter set up to play that way. And um, once your text indenter was doing that, this would make sense. Like it would automatically do this and then you turn on your virtual white space and it just goes, nope, we line up to the parentheses, right? So there's little things like that that it can do, but there's a limit to how much magic it can do because of the fact that it's still an underlying text file. Um,
Okay. So, if I intentionally wire this up in an illegal way, how could I do that? Well, we have a wire here. What if in addition to going to exit, the wire also went back to the S node? Too many outgoing paths at wire. Okay, so there we go. The checker is working. And the only thing it's not doing is it's not checking to make sure we didn't enter into an enter node. Although now that I think about it, I don't see any reason why that should be illegal. Like, like an, an enter node can just be a no op that you can enter into over and over again. Like you could put it in a loop and it wouldn't be a problem necessarily. So I'm not sure that it actually needs to be separate for that reason. I still want it to be separate so that you can make like a list of entry points um, from the outside. But yeah, okay. So we have a good graph. We have a good graph. Let's do Hmm. Let's do the machine now. So this is where we got to take the next big step. This defines a program. This constructs a program. Now we need a machine that runs the program. Here is the machine. So the first main property of the machine will be that it is looking at a node. We will call that its node putter, okay? And then we're gonna design how that, uh, how that gets manipulated. So we wanna be able to take a machine I want to be able to point it at How do I want to do this? I probably want to be able to say start this machine and here's a node. Let's try that as our starting point. And then for that to make sense, we're going to need the ability to Program construction, program ac in access for information accessors. There we go. So this would be like program construction sub chunk, and then the information accessors can go right here. Right now the builder is still acting as our handle to the whole set of nodes. And then here's the label we're looking for. And so this is just gonna be a dumb old linear search for now because a lot of this is still provisional. We're probably not gonna be gathering things off the builder. Eventually we'll want separate graph structures. So this would become a graph. And then the list of entrance nodes could be a property of the graph once it's been checked or something. So no point in trying to make this um, any smarter than this while we're still building something that's so provisional. Um, all right, grab the node off of the reference and then 
we're looking for a node whose kind is enter, so it's an enter node, and whose data creates a string which matches our label, and then that's our match. And so then we can start the machine by going in there, getting the enter node, and setting the machine's node putter to that. That's all we have to do to start it for now. So where was that to do we dropped earlier? There it is. SM builder. All right, so we're gonna need a machine down here. And I guess another thing we probably want is just, even though it, there's nothing else in the machine now. Let's just zero the struct out because that struct is probably going to grow. That represents our virtual machine state. And so when we say start, we're basically saying turn it off, turn it on, and give it an initial state. So the clear zero is the turn it off part. The machine start then goes like this. We want to app state SM machine we want to start the machine on the enter node we should be able to get an enter node by going SM enter node from label here's the here's the builder and the label is just enter I think So we started the machine, but it doesn't do anything yet. So the next thing we want to do is run the machine. And the idea is when the machine runs, it is going to be responsible for this these results moving forward. So SM machine run will happen here. Uh, running it doesn't do anything yet and that's that's something for a minute from now but we want to run the machine and now the machine is supposed to output some stuff so let's have run result so after our run uh, of the machine it should come back with some new elements text We'll leave verb text out for now, so that'll be the next big step. But we run their machine. We put an arena here. So the arena there is so that um, we have a place to put the data that is being allocated on this return here. Right? And then for now, our result can just be filler and run dot element text right and uh, we need an arena let's put that on the scratch because we don't need it to last any longer than that Cool, so we're getting foo, but that foo is now coming from inside the machine. Hmm. The verb part is harder. That would require us touching the fancy strings a little bit. Um, 
right now we don't need to fix that. Uh, we need to fix it pretty soon. Let's get as far as we can without that. We're probably going to have to take a detour to tweaking the fancy strings just a little bit. So the reason that it's going to be tricky is that right now when I create these, um, this, this like log memory, I'm just using raw plain old strings. And I probably actually want to use a chain of fancy strings. And the fancy string system wasn't really designed for incremental usage of the data structure that way. It's designed for immediate mode usage. So you begin constructing your fancy string, you construct it, you finish, and then you can use it. But then if you do that and you save it over here and then you do another one, if you want to then put those two together, it doesn't really support that. It doesn't support um, using something from the past. And I don't want to have to construct a whole separate parallel fancy string system for, for this. So it's going to have to go in and tweak the current fancy system. Right? I don't want to have to basically make a different data structure that can drive the immediate mode one. I want to just make the immediate mode one capable of going both ways. It should be able to be immediate mode, but also retained mode. So what we can do is we can say, all right, right now the machine is printing out the foo string. Let's have it instead. Uh, we'll have it default to the string null like this, but then, um, well, from here is how I want to do it. Element text. Right. And then if the machine node putter is not null, which it shouldn't be, then what we'll do is we'll replace the element text with the dev label. Right. So now, yeah, I'm stuck in the enter node, right? It, the machine doesn't move from there. But what we can do is say, okay, now what? Um, the machine should be moving ahead somehow. I want it to show the enter node. It shouldn't, it should, well, we can get a little more specific about how this should actually function, I suppose. Um, so if it's doing a run, that's different than if it was doing a step. A step, like I don't have, I don't have the luxury right now of, of having a debugger for the virtual machine that I'm designing, right? So it might be better to say, hey, instead of trying to implement the thing that does the full runtime behavior, maybe implement the smaller thing that you would use in a debugger that's like step. And so step would not necessarily always generate run results, but it could generate debug results. And then the debug results could be useful for making sure that everything works appropriately as we build this out. And I think that's more where I want to go. I don't want to be in a situation where I have invisible stuff happening. So I keep, yeah, I keep taking cracks at this and getting stuck on the fact that it's really hard to debug one of these things. So let's take a different approach. Our game still just says foo all the time, but let's introduce debug text. And in step mode, which is what we're building, what'll happen is we'll set the debug text using the rules we just had for the element text. Right, and that's the dev label, so that makes sense. Debug text. And so when I step, instead of run, right, so if this was in
So if we're not in debug mode, it'll run. But if we are in debug mode, then it just executes a step. And I have to go over into the app SM run. So we have a step version as well there. Or maybe but yeah, we'll just bury this underneath the app run function. So if you are in debug mode, you will run the step mode, right? You'll do a single step and you get this back. Then what you'll do is you say, okay, um, if run dot element text dot size is greater than zero, Right, so if we got something back, we used it, and if we got nothing back, then fine, oh well. Uh, the verb will always come out there, and we'll get that figured out soon. But then we'll say, okay, if we're in debug mode, and run dot debug text dot size is greater than zero. Then over here we have this verb one. Let's just have a debug one as well. So this will be just like that. Except then it contains the debug text. And then over here, if we're in debug mode, we'll do the same thing we did for the verb, but on the debug. And we won't mark it as a live. And we will put it into its dev font. Great, so you can see now I have the main game stuff and then right there, little dev mode little dev mode uh, thing, right? And if I turn off debug mode, well then the problem is we don't actually have a run function, so can't do that right now. All right, I am going to pause for a minute. Um, let's take a quick break. Stretch my legs, visit the bathroom. Uh, I'll be back pretty soon. Something like there. Alrighty, be back in a minute.
Okay. <sighs> so we have the ability to see which node we're on. Now, how should the update rule work? So when you first start it, you set the node pointer. I feel like something I want here is if we're in development mode, if we're in debug mode, then it won't run at first. So it'll leave it in its initial state and let us execute even that first step manually. Does that work? Now that leads to a crash. And the reason that leads to a crash is because without Yeah, okay. Um, without doing a run of any kind, nothing initializes um, the verb here, right? Um, So, I think what I want is I want a thing that just says, look, you have to also check this has to be non null. And this has to be non null. Now, with the verb, if it is null, we need a backup plan. And so that'll backup plan will look like that. And then interestingly, I don't need, I don't need any of this right now. Strange. Why is that off now? Right, so here it should be highlighting this. Unless there's. When we continue, we increment the page number. Uh, that doesn't quite work. I mean, I don't really care about the page number the way I did when I first built it. I think for now what I could do I could just say, hey, forget about this completely. Let's set the page numbers. After we do the main 
after we do the main string, is there any way with a string to figure out the page count? So this page number right there, we do a page number on I think it might just be as easy as saying that we update the last page all the time. This is still like the interface here is like half a hack. Um, I'm just sort of keeping it doing roughly what I want. And so the page numbers were made, the page numbers made more sense when I wasn't doing a full log thing. But now that I'm kind of going for this scrolling log thing, I think the fancy string would look a little different if I started from scratch on it. But I'm really trying to avoid that because there's a lot of good stuff in the fancy string that I don't want to have to do again regarding laying things out and wrapping. I'm trying to keep the part of it that's working intact. And I'll need to do a, a careful rethink of its design for the, for the new uh, interface style at some point. But let's say we go into the main string here. And we set the interface page number to the main string page number. Does that do the trick? Yes, okay. All right, so that's cool. Let me think, what might be a good thing to do next? Um, we're trying to get to the point that the machine actually does uh, useful work. And we've, we've been setting up this, okay. Whoops. Uh, There we go. Stay. All right. Um, so I want to look at spots where the step function can happen, right? So here, when it steps, the next step is make that do something. So we tell the machine to step. This is where talking out loud is less helpful. We tell the machine to step. Okay, so something I wanna do is I wanna separate out the debug info from the rest. So the idea here is this does not modify the machine at all, it just generates the debug string. And the reason I want to do that is 
for one thing because I can then do this. I can go, okay, let's see. If we're in debug mode, make a debug string on the scratch arena and put the debug string in right here, okay? But I also wanna be able to, I'm trying to get to a point where here I would see that I'm in the enter node. So what's happening is we do SM start. We don't wanna run right away, but we wanna see that we're in the debug mode. Now the result arena, which lives right here, contain gets flushed and contains the result of the most recent run or step. So I don't want to have to, like, I don't want to have to, so what I'm thinking of doing is something like this, right? Uh, let's just do this, even though I know it's wrong, because I'm having a hard time thinking about how to do it right off the top of my head, but I know I want this. And so then instead of checking if we're in debug mode, you would do this. You would still step instead of running, but you would go, hey, we want to get the debug string. So the debug thing is just about printing out and updating the debug thing here. So this is basically saying get the debug get get the debug data out of the machine for the current state of the machine, whatever it is. And so I think what needs to happen. So we're probably going to need a debug arena that can just live independent of the result arena. Okay, so then at the beginning, if we're not in debug mode, we run right away. If we are in debug mode, we update the debug state right away. We, like, we, gra we gather debug data from the, the initial state right away and we don't run. And then if we're in debug mode, then it prints the debug state here. I think we could just leave that one out and it should be fine. Here, if we are told to run and we're in debug mode, then we step. 
Yep, SM debug. So the question is, when are we told to SM run there? And if we are in debug mode, then after we run, we also update the debug data. Right, so then the question is, did we catch all of these? At the beginning, we don't run, we do the debug data instead. After that, when we do the continue off of a off of the interface, we run and we get debug data. The run gets replaced with stepping in, inside its implementation in debug mode. And there we go. Very nice, okay. So now, the next interesting step here is when we step. Let's ignore all of that for now. What's actually interesting is when we step, we want to update the state of the machine. So the way that will work is we will look at the node we're on and do something about it. Now, what kind of nodes do we have? If we are on a node called enter, then we wanna go get the path that lives uh, here. There should only be one of them, right? Because we've already checked all the nodes. And we wanna set the node pointer to the path's destination node. That's how we do a step on that type of node. If it's an exit type of node, then we do nothing. Um, we might later wanna say here on the machine, we'll mark it as, um, uh, you know, the machine has to stop or the machine has to pop off the call stack or something. If we see a wire node, for now, we'll again do the same thing we did with enter. Later on, this would include also updating some variable values through a expression interpreter. Now, if we see a, no a show node, uh, again, we update by going forward. Later on, we'll have that actually emit some game text. Now, fork and verb are more interesting cases. If we reach a fork, we have quite a thing to do. Um, and we have to think about what we mean by step in a case where a, a fork. Um, because it's really not clear. So, um, so fork when you're running and you're not stepping, means look ahead. I mean, first of all, you're gonna have to stop here. Um, and instead of stopping to show more gameplay text, you're stopping to show a list of potential paths so it's a choice for the player to make. And you look down each path and compute it out until you find a verb. And so the fork 
is a, a, a specific change in mode and it, 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 inside this during a run, it would be like shift into the non-deterministic mode and create this queue of all the places we need to visit. We need to visit um, each of the paths that come off of this fork, basically. And it would take something off that queue, run that until it found a verb and, or a block and save it. Um, and then take the next one off, run it till found a verb or fork and save it and so on and so on and so on. So what does it mean to step through that? Well, maybe what it means to step through that is to fill up the queue and to shift the mode, right? So let's, let's play this much. We're on the enter node. We're on the S node, we're on the F node. That's the fork and it cannot continue from there. Okay, so let me fix that those labels. So S is the show node, F is the fork node, right? Just so that doesn't look like it was like a bug or something. Enter, show, fork, and then we're stuck, right? Now, we'll call it fork mode. And when you enter into fork mode, you do it right there. And you're gonna need a node ref queue here. So we're gonna have fork queue first, fork queue last. And then we want a free list of those things. When we memory zero this out, We're assuming that it's a single flat struct. What if we want it to be able to grow? Okay, so we set up a machine like that now, which means we need to go change the app state.
And when we're first initializing everything after we've done the SM builder, we'll just do app state SM machine equals SM machine new. Okay, and so now when we go into fork mode, what we want to do is one by one, we're going to go across the paths that are going out from this node. And we're going to machine fork queue push like this. So we just are building that queue, right? Um, this will go down here as a part of the sort of internal machinery of the machine. Fork queue push. Okay, so we have these node references. We want to try to get one off of the, let's see, we called it the fork queue free list. I'm just going to call this the node ref free list since we might have more than one kind of node ref chain later. So they might as well all be on the same free list. If the ref we get back from that exists, then we can pop it off the free list. Otherwise, we'll just push onto that arena, right? We set up that arena so that we could create new node references whenever necessary. And once we have one, we set its node and we want to queue that up on the machine's fork queue. Fork queue free should be node ref free. Okay. Uh, you need another argument. You want the ref, so that chains you up into the queue. Okay. So now, when we reach the fork, we set us ourselves into fork mode. We in queue all of the paths that leave this fork. And so, what we want to do now is say, okay, that. What we do here is what we do when the machine is not in fork mode. Right, so this is if we're not in fork mode, we behave this way. If we are in fork mode, something different will happen. And now that it starts to get more interesting, what I want to do is say the debug text that we're ultimately going to put out here might need to get built piece by piece like this. And then finally, condensed right here into a single result. And so this can be like um, push onto the string list the dev label and otherwise push. null like that and separately if the machine is in fork mode uh, I don't know we maybe want to just do like node label equals for this still 
so we can compose it more nicely or something. I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean, we could we could go like real deep on making a UI system just for the purpose of, of seeing the virtual machine run visually. And that, that would be a huge project, not a small one, right? Um, so before I commit to that, I want to know that it works a little bit. Um, so we're just trying to get by. We're trying to get by just just successfully enough to actually not kill kill momentum. We don't want to kill momentum by going all in on the development tool or by or kill momentum by not having enough development tool to actually see if this idea works. It's it's a tricky balance. So For now, what I'll do is I'll say, um, we're trying to do something like straight list push F. Node label, okay. And then here, it's gonna be something like mode. Mode label. And then if we're in fork mode, I think I think that's good. I think that's good for now. Let's see that play out. So we're in that mode, mode. So we've arrived at fork and we're in deterministic mode. So we haven't run the fork yet. And then when we do this, now we've run the fork instruction and we're in fork mode. So the next step would be whatever comes out from this. So this here is where we continue. So in order to do this, what we do is we say, um, This isn't really what we want. Uh, what we want is um, So you execute the fork instruction, puts you in fork mode, fills up the queue. Now, anytime you are, yeah, so we're gonna end up needing like SM mode here, right? This is gonna have to be more than just one Boolean. It's gonna have a couple of different values there so we have deterministic mode fork mode and then we're gonna have like non-deterministic mode right so here mode becomes fork and down here we'll set this as machine mode mode 
label equals that. So that's how we get our mode label. Except let's do that, okay. And then I guess might as well have some fun. There we go, line those up. So mode comes out looking like that. When we start, we're in deterministic mode. If we come in here and we are in deterministic mode when we hit a fork, so when we hit a fork, we should always be in deterministic mode. And then we transition into fork mode. In fork mode, we fill those up. And then if we're up here, we find ourselves in the fork mode. Then what we do So we take a look at the queue, right? We go, give me this. If this is equal to zero, then that part's a little tricky. That's where we've finished analyzing the fork. And so we would then enter into a mode of like a waiting uh, a verb or something like that. So it's, this would be like the await mode or something like this. I'm not sure. Not sure what it would be. Um, something like that. And um, and when that happens, you don't execute a node anymore. All right. Once you find yourself in a wait mode, we could do it like this. If you're in a wait mode, you do not execute a node. Await mode means that the user now needs to choose which verb path to select. Now, if you are in fork mode and that thing comes back, isn't that isn't that comes the, the thing off the top of the queue there or the front of the queue isn't null? That means we have an actual node there and we can uh, pop the fork queue and stick the uh, the node reference that we are holding on to onto the free list. All right, so we pop that reference off the queue and put it on the free list. We have the node pointer in question. So we then set the node putter for the machine to that node. And we set the machine's mode to non-deterministic execution. And what I wanna do is say like we only ever so that should be like, this is should be one step. Um, you shouldn't do that and then also do this. So in fork mode, you do this. Yeah, so let's just say at the beginning, you switch on your mode. 
if you are in deterministic mode or if you are in non-deterministic mode, that'll be when you end up in this path. There'll be some subtle differences, but majorly they'll be similar. Um, some of these won't be allowed in either case, so you have to be deterministic to fork or to exit or um, later on if we do a call, you'll need that. And there might be, there are other ones like verb, which will require you to be in non-deterministic mode. So these, while these aren't exactly the same, they, they are sort of overlapping sets of behaviors. Um, now in fork mode, you'll get this behavior. And if you are in a wait mode, you'll do nothing because you need to get out of a wait mode before you can do anything. So a wait mode is like a holding pattern. The something outside the system has to happen to perturb it out of that mode. And then once we have that thing, we would need another one, which is sort of the uh, verb walk or something like that. We need another mode, which would be once we've gotten out of a wait mode, there will be a mode which says, okay, the user has selected which path to take and we're walking along that path, um, which is sort of collapsing a non-deterministic, you know, a fork section down into a single deterministic section. So we're in the enter node, deterministic mode. Show mo node, the fork node, that goes into the fork mode. And now we're looking at the thief path and that's where we get stuck. Okay, cool. So that's cool. So how did it get to the thief mode? Let's just double check that I remember um, really? Can you? Okay. Um, so fork goes to thief first, and that's a verb. Um, yeah. So it doesn't make forward progress because it doesn't know what to do with a verb. So, um, let's Let's see. Um, we implemented fork. If we reach a verb node, then what I want the machine to do, this has to be non-deterministic mode to be done, um, is it needs to save. So when we're in non when we're in when we're in the non-deterministic mode. Let's remember I'm trying to think of how I want to do this. Do I want to remember every single node I visited along the way? I shouldn't need to. The only spot where a non-determinist decision got made was at a fork node, right? At the fork node, there's a branch that is not determined within the system, essentially. And so I want to remember which one I was taking 
but then it the user should be able to just send it down that path and it'll execute all the rest deterministically right there's not more non-determinism once you've started right uh, so for now one of these should work I think in the long run this is going to get more complicated because I do anticipate wanting nodes that do sort of the transition from non-deterministic section to a deterministic section without actually like like how do I want to describe this a ver without actually being an endpoint so the verb acts as an endpoint to non-determinism and the block which I think we don't even have yet but once we have a block the block would also act as a thing which only appears in non-deterministic mode but it represents the idea that you cannot actually go down this path another thing I could have is a sort of look ahead which would be something like hey we're entering back into deterministic mode essentially but I don't want to emit a verb here instead I want to keep executing this deterministic path until another non-deterministic node occurs another fork and so that lets me then gather verbs from the next non-determinism Libinx, uh, the editor is Forcoder. Um, you can, uh, let's see, yeah, Forcoder.net. You'll find um, it's a uh, you can you can get it for free on itch or get the open source version. There's a community fork of it. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is the official one, but like there are a few different people maintaining open source forks of it. Um, here's one of them, Fork Twitter community. So you can get in there and modify it if that's something you would be interested in. If it's um, not quite what you want when you first start with it um, uh, what would I call this so we're at a, we're standing at a fork and we have multiple paths we can take and each of those represents like a potential so this will be like the um, Oh, but what is it? It's, 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 this is the memory of which path we took. So this is the taken node um, selected fork select fork select node footer or something like that uh sorry about slugs i still have links censored i keep forgetting i want to change that um if you could find a way to type it out without making it look like a link so that it doesn't get censored that would be good um SSSH 2001. Uh, I am working on something I call a story engine. It's essentially, uh, it's essentially just a vision that I have right now and not something real, so it's a little hard to describe. But you could think of it like a text adventure uh, game engine with uh, the ability to do a lot more than what a classical text adventure can do by having um, much more programmable underlying system so that there can be a lot of dynamic recombination of story elements very rapidly from uh, from the authoring uh, tools and so I have to build right now I have to build I, I'm working on the design for an underlying execution model that will sort of work as the core um, the core logic system 
it's not AI is based. So we're not talking about an AI generating a story for me. It's actually completely 100% authored, right? It's a human who authors all of it, but it's about like, um, giving the author, uh, tools for authoring and an, an execution runtime that can take little story fragments and sort of fuse them together in lots and lots of different ways so that instead of having you know in today when you make a story game you have to like manually brand cater all these different or um, manually craft the branches and interrelatedness and i'm looking for a tool to that assist with that to such a high degree that the density of story options and the recombination of story fragments creates a lot more density than what we get out of current story, uh, like choice narrative kind of choices matter narrative game kinds of things. Like I want to, I want to take that concept and up the density of choices and interconnected uh, systems as much as possible, and so I'm exploring ways to do that. It's kind of an explorative, researchy kind of thing. I have some confidence that this is possible, although I don't know if my approach is going to get us there. So. That's what makes it an experiment. Um, it wouldn't really be, it wouldn't like, this would be pretty orthogonal to AI though. It's not really generative, right? This does not make stuff up. This is, this is about as generative as Spelunky, right? So if you've ever played Spelunky or any other roguelike where they have fixed pieces that get stuck together by a generator, that's about as, as close to generative as this is going to be it's going to feel a lot more um it's going to feel a lot more designed by a human um although you could easily make this work in conjunction with ai if what you wanted was uh to have it adapt to to have the interface adapt rapidly in really rich ways i could imagine that but it would be different All right, so we reach the fork node. We switch into fork mode. Then it creates, so when it went to fork mode, it created the queue. Now it should create the thief node and it's in non-deterministic mode, but it still doesn't know how to run a verb. But what I wanted to do was when I'm in fork mode, if I select, yeah, so right here I selected a node Let's have it say, when you do this, in addition to getting the node pointer, here's the fork select node pointer. Uh, Leon, Leon, Leonilian uh, says that the way I was talking about the, the nodes and the um, uh, well, I'm not sure what part of the nodes, but it sounded reminiscent of a machine learning algorithm. Uh, I can see that the, like they both, the the graph topology like the using discrete topology through graph, uh, there are a couple different AI at least in the world of AI there are a couple different things but this is much closer, in my mind to, like compiler technology, than to AI technology because we're talking about, um, it, like something like independent instructions and then connecting them together and so it's very common in compiler land to have intermediate representations that look sort of like what I'm doing. The fork part is more like a chess engine AI or something like that where it sort of becomes a game tree and so it has to look down the different possibilities of what could happen and evaluate those. There is a degree to which like you could imagine taking what I'm building and using it as a driver for a complex game logic. Like if you have a board game and you encode its rules into my engine I imagine you could then use that to sort of start creating an AI that could play the game because it could look down the paths of what moves it can make at each given step uh, with this sort of structure. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, that's fair enough. SSH. I uh, I really don't know what does and doesn't count as AI. If 
if AI just means computers doing anything fancier than what you learn in the first year of computer science school, then sure. Um, if AI means machine learning, then I don't I, like I'm not doing any statistical methods or anything like that. But like, if a chess engine is AI, then this is halfway there because it is sort of creating a game tree programmatically. But still, like I don't know. To me, I I, I just I'm saying if you want to know what what set of thoughts I use to structure my ideas, it's much more of this comes from compiler land. I'm much more um, soaked in those kinds of ideas than from AI land ideas. Okay, so we selected our node pointer there. So what I want to do is I want to have my debug mode. Now, if we have a fork select node pointer, we will put that in there. F cell equals, and then we need a node label, and we'll get our node label this time like this from the fork select node pointer. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I appreciate it. Um, I, I really haven't thought too much about how this relates to either modern AI or like the whole broad realm of AI. It's just not a space I've spent too much time in. So I, I it's not that there might not be a relationship. It's just that, like I'm, I'm not cite. There's no citations to my ideas in that direction. All all my citations go to like, oh, here's the intermediate representation being used by compiler backends and and stuff like that. Um, as long as that's clear to everybody, I don't really mind if it has relationships to other things that I don't see. Um, okay, so the. The verb the verb needs to do the following. Uh, it needs to save onto the machine a record. So as we're going here, we have this fork queue and we're pulling off one at a time. Uh, the, the places we would like to uh, explore in the queue. When we reach a verb, we're kind of building a new queue. So this is going to be like our verb queue. And the reason that has to be separate is because it needs a little bit more information. Once we reach a verb, we have more information than what we had when we started that path. So we start down a path, we compute what that path leads to and then we save that and we're going to restore back to the fork um, so uh oh have i lost stream it says i'm disconnected from chat okay it's back um So Leonilian, yeah, I I do um I, I don't work at a university or anything like that. Um so here's my website, mrforth.com. I do these like independent, uh, I call it practical research projects. So like what I'm doing right now is not really cutting edge on anything that I think um, p 
people in academia or industry care about as much as it's uh, directly applicable to solving a problem. It, it's more like we, we know in theory that what I'm doing is possible, but the practicalities of it haven't been figured out yet. So I just try to figure out how to make things that we know should be possible uh, actually start working. And in this case, the thing I'm looking at is the story, like interactive fiction stuff, because it feels to me like it's a space where lots of people have an intuition that this should this stuff should be able to do more than we know what to do with it. And I don't see any theoretical reasons why not. It looks more to me like we are simply missing one or two key ideas in either the compute model or in the composition of a slightly different type of data structure that the interactive fiction people like to use, but that it doesn't compose quite right. And so I'm, I'm just exploring that space to see if there's um, some ideas from like deeper computer science stuff that we already know about that haven't been percolated to this particular practical problem. Yeah, exactly. I'm not really breaking ground on new theoretical ideas or coming up with new algorithms so much as I'm taking the, the deep theoretical stuff, which I, I have like, you know, I've spent some time at a university and I've spent some time in the industry doing similar kinds of things. And so I've got enough experience with um, both, both like hard stuff in the operating system world of like, how do these weird operating system features work? And also theoretical stuff like uh, compiler theory and stuff that I've spent enough time with. Not that I'm like cutting edge on those, but I can take what we know how to do and bring it up a level to like, hey, let's let's apply it to the problems that are uh, still struggling to make progress and see if any of them are ready to move forward with a slightly more rich set of ideas. I think that this one is, I think that this particular area has a lot of promise because while the storytelling uh, purpose is not like it might not seem important to make a better story game right it's like what's the point of a game how does that advance the state of the art i honestly think it would make a big difference if there was a way for people who are good at storytelling who feel comfortable in that mode of describing their ideas if they could express a program that would be a breakthrough because people like that right now have to express programs through these more procedural or functional methods but if there was like a, a narrative method that actually the interface allowed them to express their ideas narratively and then it, it became a program in the way that they would expect fully from that, that's like a, a new way for someone to interact with a computer. And it also, there are, there are things like we talked about, you know, if you want to build an AI for a complex board game, I think something like this is a programming paradigm you would want uh, if I'm able to crack it. and. And there are other things like like tutorials, right? If you're making a program, um, if you're making if you're making an application and you want to create a walkthrough of like here's how to do steps, uh, I think something like this would be appropriate there too. So there's a lot of places where once once it's worked out in a game to like an extraordinarily complicated degrees, I'm sure that these things can find other practical applications. But there's a first step of kind of just like have fun with this, figure out where these ideas, figure out some ideas that can come together in new ways by by making a game, right? That's kind of where I'm starting. And there's some other practical stuff I want to work on too along the way, like, um, it's going to sound really lame, but like uh, just, just old school tool chain stuff like linkers and things. There are some options that I know about there that we're not taking advantage of that I think could lead to... Uh, better ways of, of organizing programs, especially like if something we really struggle with these days is it doesn't seem like a single, it doesn't seem like a single uh, language for all things is a good idea, right? No matter how, no matter how carefully you design a language, it's always poorly designed for certain kinds of use cases because we just the, the 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 interface of a text file into a compi into a compiler or into an interpreter and out the other end a running program that interface is too narrow 
and we have too many good ideas to fit into just one keyhole like that. So we end up with multiple of them a lot of the time and interoperation between those is uh, kind of a nightmare. And so it seems to me like that's, that's another place where if I get far enough along on this where I'm like, hey, here's a cool way to program where you make these story graphs that compose and they run in this certain way, great, but now what if you wanna compose that with your C++ game engine or something else? There's another research project there. So I'm kind of making a game for now, but yeah, I do, the, uh, to answer your original question, I'm doing all this as like sort of practical research stuff, stuff that I know we can probably get better at, but that is mostly non-theoretical uh, in terms of what the problem actually is. Uh, hi, Hector Jazz, welcome to the, uh, welcome to the stream. Okay, so the idea is when we reach a verb, I'm going to be pushing new verbs on to the verb queue. So a verb is going to contain two pieces of information. The fork select node pointer and the final verb that we have reached, right? So here we reached a verb node and we want to, whoops, I don't want to push them on as a two separate pushes. So we say, here's the select node pointer and here's the, the node where you end up when you do that. Um, so that goes onto the verb queue and let's implement that part. And uh, I'm going back to the conversation about research stuff. Another thing that I like about um, what I get to do here is that like, I feel like it's a lot more fun to share this stuff in public because there's a lot more ideas to explore than what I can do by myself. So like part of the reason why I stream is, and why I do stuff on YouTube is because I want to show how these ideas that look super esoteric and boring can actually be brought to a, to areas where they are they are fun. That's why I'm making it a game too. It's like, it has to be fun because there's too much work to do to not have fun with it. So I, I hope I can make some progress in making it fun. I'm not necessarily the best person in the world for making something fun. Uh, there are more fun people than me, but I can do my part. All right, so here I'm just allocating a verb node, and then we want to push that onto the verb queue and we want to save okay the verb queue needs to have a fork select and a node so the There we go, I like that. And so here, the node just has two of these node, or the node, verb just has two of these nodes on it. The fork select. The fork select is the one that says we were standing at a fork and there were several different places to go. This is the one uh, to go, this is, this verb corresponds to, the, the verb stands at the end of the path, the fork select 
is the sign that points in that direction, right? And then there's the verb at the end of the path. The verb at the end of the path is what encodes the interface information about how to get there. And that, that inversion where at the compute level, the interface appears to be this sort of opaque set of options. And at the end of each path, there's a verb. That's a part of the magic because that means I can change what the verb is for going down certain paths based on the state of the, the rest of the machine. I can hide certain paths by blocking them later and stuff. Um, uh, so I don't have to make a one-to-one -one relationship between the initial set of fork path, like options out of the fork, and the actual uh, interface that ultimately gets exposed. Those are sort of uh, procedurally separated from each other now. Okay, so that part is cool, but, but, oh, right. Okay, so we'll call that the verb node. I guess I'll call this the verb node too. How about that? Okay, so The idea here is once we reach the await mode, this verb queue becomes the actual interface for making progress. But there's a piece of this that isn't right, that isn't ready. And that's that once I've reached a verb, I've put it on to, I put that path onto the queue. I somehow need to make my way back to the fork mode and back to the fork node that's kicked this off, right? Well, I don't really need to get back to the fork node necessarily. Like I, I, that part is less important. But if I have, for instance, variables or a call stack, um, those all need to get restored now. So I think what I'm going to need is something like when I reach the fork, these are all the, the, the places that I, th this is the fork queue that says here are all, all the paths to take. I need some way to say that at that moment, I also did like a fork save on the machine. And then what I would do is after a verb queue push here, so I've re reached a verb, so that's the end of the line, that's the end of one non-deterministic line. Here I would need to do like machine fork restore, right? And so here, when I first reach the fork, I save that state. That does not include the fork queue or the verb queue. Those sit outside the fork save and fork restore. But um, if I have variables, and stacks for function calls and stuff, then that's what this refers to here. Now the other tricky thing is if I end up later having forks inside of forks, so right now I'm disallowing that, but I do expect that I will either allow forks inside of forks or I will have a special node that's like a look ahead node that would essentially let you do the same thing. So you can have, while you're in a non-deterministic look ahead situation, you reach another branch that that looks ahead, that goes off in more branch like ways, another fork, I should say, right? Another another piece of uh, sprouting out. And, there, and there's a lot of reasons why that can be useful. I have found as I've been exploring the low level, like the different pieces I want for putting together different patterns and stuff includes that a lot of the time. So I would want that to work. And I want to take a minute now to just talk through how that could work. So once I reach another fork inside of a fork, like if I'm in non-deterministic mode and I reach a fork, how is that different from this? Well, I'm still gonna need to eventually go back to the original fork and keep going from there. The verb queue, so here's a couple things that need to change. Once I have two forks, this starts becoming insufficient, right? Fork select works, 
because it says there is a single node that tells you what to do at a fork, at, at the fork where you started. But if I can see a fork, go down a path and hit another fork, then I'm gonna need to make another selection, right? I've got selection number one, took a path, fork, selection two, before I actually got my list of, before I turned that into a final verb. And so now I need a chain of, if you go down this path, then there's like one, two, three options, right? It's like you went this way and then one, two, three sub options. And so we now need our fork select to become a chain. And when we save a verb, we're saving the entire chain of the entire fork select chain and the final verb node. And dun, 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 um, all of the verbs get collected into one list still. So it's like a tree with each fork being an internal node and the verbs being leaves. And, and so we could think of this, instead of building a verb queue, we could think of it as building a verb tree where the root is a fork select. Well, yeah, the root is the original fork. Each, uh, child edge on the tree is like a fork select, which either leads to a verb, which is a leaf, or to another fork in the tree, right? So that would be how we would turn this into a verb tree. And then the question is, when I reach a verb, I'm always gonna be restoring back to the fork save here, right, to the most recent fork. That, the verb is always a verb to the most recent fork. But once I've done all of the things on right so the, the 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 fork queue then would need to have like layers because if i'm if i have my initial fork i've got three paths right so initial fork one two three paths i go down this path here right so then another fork with one two three paths so the original queue had one two three things in it i popped one off and started dealing with it then i went here and i have one two three so it's kind of a um depth first thing now, right? So I use a queue, but maybe what I wanted was a stack. Because if I use a stack, then I can push, 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 or I could do it this way, right? One, two, three means push these on in reverse order, pop this one off, push these on in reverse order, d -d 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 pop this one off. There's a, we find a verb, pop this one off, we find a verb, pop this one off, we find a verb. So we would have to remember at each, um, yeah, I could see this working. I could see this working. This is a little bit gnarly, but there's a way to do this where you never have to do anything besides constant time work. Um, or rather, work that is linear in the size of the fork, right? So right here, I have to do a loop over the, the paths of the fork. That is not constant time from the perspective of the size of, like, that, that can grow, but depending on how many paths you have shooting out of the fork. But besides that, I don't think it would need to be any more complicated than that. Because what would happen is we'd start going like, okay, SM machine uh, fork node, right? We'd be like, here's the machine, here's the fork. And then SM machine fork we wouldn't even have to worry about putting them in the right order or wrong order. The only reason I would want to do that is I do want to be able to control. So when we go to create an interface from this, the order does matter, right? So if I said verb one, verb two, verb three, uh, as the order of the, the paths, right? Cause the basically outside, when you, when you look at the paths from a fork, you could think of that as a set, but I'm actually thinking of it as an ordered list and the order matters because the verbs that come out come out in a certain order based on the paths on those nodes and the order of the verbs just matters because you know when you go to create an interface you might lay them out as a set of buttons or you might you know you might care about the order of the verbs and so you control the order that the verbs come out in via the order that they are attached to the fork but Ignoring that for now, if we're doing a stack, it could go like, here's select this node, 
in the system that's like the fork node. And if we're if we don't have a fork tree at all, that becomes the root. But if we already have a fork tree, it becomes another step in the another node in the fork tree, right? And then we would have like fork path machine path just like this. And when we say fork path, that's where it keeps a stack of all of the unvisited sort of buds. We could think of this like a tree that's growing, right? It's not just a tree, but it's a tree that's growing. And so the stack is really a, a list of the, the buds that have not reached full bloom, let's say. And when you go to a bud, you then execute code from there. The bud has in it uh, the knowledge of which fork node created it. And so it can restore that if it needs to, and then run um, forward, right? It can, it can run the machine until it reaches a verb or a block. If it reaches another fork, it'll create another fork node, save that and put the paths down again. So it's another, it's like that bud didn't lead to a blossom, it led to another fork in the tree another set of branches and so again you would push down more buds onto the stack right you got this new the list of you took one bud off and it turned into more buds instead of a flower and then eventually you go and you find a verb flower verb flower maybe some of them get blocked and so that gets hidden away gets removed right gets pruned we could say prune is a good word for it um this metaphor i feel like kind of kind of works so Once it's done, what it will have done is built a tree data structure that represents all of these fork nodes that were reachable and verbs, at a list of verbs which make up the leaves of the tree. And in order to um, use a verb, you will just walk up its chain of parents back to the root and that creates the list of which decisions to make, right? So you would you'd go like, choose this verb, you'd walk that chain as you walk the chain, you can imagine like you walk it and reverse it into a single list. And then that tells you, okay, run, every time you re start running and every time you reach a fork, follow the decisions made here until you get back into deterministic mode. Okay, I'm happy with that because that, I'm not gonna do that right now, but I just wanted to make sure, I wanted to make sure that there was a path forward here that seemed coherent to me. And that seems, that seems, like a full story that works. So we might get back to that later, or that might be another something I have to do on, on, on another occasion, maybe off stream, maybe on stream, I don't know. For now, we'll just do this more simply. We'll do a fork save, um, and then fill up the list, and then fork restore. And so that is the part that's gonna save and restore all of the state that lives outside of the non-deterministic control flow. So this here is non-deterministic control flow, right? That does not get saved and restored by the fork save and fork restore. But um, if we have later, right, this will be our uh, memory and this is our main control state. If later we have, um, uh, if later we have something like variable state or something like that, or virtual memory or whatever we would call it, where we have, here's our, you know, memory, you can imagine, but I, I don't know if like, maybe I just have literally a memory block of a few megabytes and I have an actual like, pretend call stack and a set of variables mapped into that. Or maybe I have something that's like, here's the list of variables, you know, uh, variable uh, hash or whatever, right? And so there's our var hash and then here's our call stack, right? You could imagine I could go in different directions with this. So it might be, it might be um, higher level, it might be lower level, but whatever it is, it would have, this would be the stuff that has to get saved and restored by fork save and fork restore. Um, okay, so in the meantime, let's just st 
stick this there and there. There's not actually anything to save or restore now, but I want to have those there because I know we'll need them over time. So I'm just getting them ready to start collecting up anytime I add some state that does actually need to go through restore. These don't have to go through restore just because um, we end up having to manually rearrange those states anyways. Like you can see here, I'm changing the fork right before I save. To, and when I go to um, fork restore, I'm gonna also set it into fork mode. And the reason I'm setting that into fork mode is because fork mode is where it will go and pop more off the queue. So we put something on the verb queue and now it's gonna go and pop something off the fork queue. And then uh, the node putter gets automatically. So when we're in fork mode, you can see the node putter doesn't actually matter. In fork mode, what matters is what's in the fork queue and that sets us up into a new non-deterministic node here. So when we reach a verb and we execute it, it does not change, we stay on the verb for a, a turn because we do a change of mode and a restore of state for that instruction. And then it's while we're in fork mode that we then go back into non-deterministic mode or into the await mode. Okay, so with that, Fork restore, fork restore. I've spelled it differently somewhere. Ah. Okay, so fork deterministic mode. Now the fork takes us to fork mode. Fork mode takes us to the thief verb. And that's also our F cell select. So in this case, nothing happened. The, 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 the selection node and the verb node were the same. That's fine. So then it's gonna take us to fork mode. Okay, right, so when we go into fork mode, another thing we wanna do is, um, when we're leaving fork mode, we go into non-deterministic mode and we set the fork select node pointer. Um, let's just set that back to null when we go into fork mode. So if we're in non-deterministic mode, we have this. When we leave non-deterministic mode, we should unset that. So we're in the thief node, non-deterministic mode, and the F select, the fork select is the thief node. Now we're back in the fork mode. Okay, so the issue we're having is we're stuck going from, yeah, we keep getting sent back to the fork mode. Why is that happening? Or to the thief node. Right, so here I'm in thief, then it goes to fork mode and it has lost this at fork select. Now in fork mode, it should be popping a new node here, which should not be the thief node. Unless, ah, I didn't give them their own names like I should have. So that makes sense. This is cool. I think for once I'm actually finding a compute compute model that's gonna make this work. Yeah, okay. So awesome. And now we're stuck in the await mode. Great. So the way this worked, and it just did the right thing, it started here, it executed this node, the enter node, the show node, the fork node, then it went into fork mode, it went into the thief non-deterministically. And then it went back to fork mode. It went into the beast slayer non-deterministically. It went back to the fork node. It went to the archaeologist non-deterministically. It went back to the fork node. And then, well, it didn't really go back to the fork node. I should be saying it's going back to fork mode. Then, after it went to fork mode, it went to the await node mode. The reason it went to the await mode is because it has no more paths to take, right? Those are the only ways to get out of the fork. Um, if we look here, the fork node goes there, it goes there, and it goes there, but then it doesn't go anywhere else. So it's looked at all of its options and it got into the await mode. So the next thing we need to do is to build the system that lets it get out of the await mode. And before I do that, I wanna keep an eye out. I'm gonna end up end my stream sometime um, 
sometime probably in the next hour or so um, to go hang out in Abner Coinbrae's stream. So if you don't know, if you're watching me and you don't know Abner, uh, him and I are going to do a little test stream together. So I'm just going to keep an eye out for that uh, moving forward since we're getting close to time for me to hop over and hang out with him. Uh, but it looks like probably good to go for now. Um, okay, we'll keep an eye out. So, let's see, let's see, let's see. Right, we're in the await mode. Now, stepping shouldn't do anything when we're in the await mode. When we're in the await mode, we need to be perturbed from outside. So the whole point of this is it's a non-deterministic machine. And by non-deterministic, I don't mean random. I mean there are moments called forks in the, in, in the uh, model where it is not determined within the machine itself how to advance. So once you've programmed one of these, you've made a bunch of decisions about what should happen, but you left some decisions unmade for an outside controller, whether that be a human or an AI or uh, you know, a, a procedural generation algorithm or something. Something outside is gonna decide what paths to take through those non-deterministic options. Um, and so this lets you program up to the point where a certain decision gets made that you don't wanna decide and export it out through a non-deterministic porthole through the machine to another universe or something like that, right? <sighs> to then make progress, that other universe has to decide what to do because we don't know how to build real non-deterministic machines, right? If I could build you a real non-deterministic machine, what it would do is it would reach that point and then all possible paths would continue forward simultaneously as if it was one program. But the, if I actually do that, then the number of ongoing states that I have evolving would grow exponentially uh, very quickly. And uh, while that might be interesting, that's not particularly useful. The, the thing I'm going for here is that there's that outside control that then lets this fall back into the determinism right away. So the question is, what does that interface look like? I'm thinking something like select. Since we called, um, since we called the uh, the the thing that helps us keep track of where which path we're currently exploring, uh, the fork select. So I think that that select is kind of the idea here. We're selecting a path. And now the question is, how do I want to key these? I could key them by passing the verb down. I could key this by passing the verb node down. The cool thing about passing the verb down is the verb node is cool, but then I'll have to scan the verb chain to find the one that contains the verb node I want. And if it doesn't contain it, then I have a problem. Later, if this is going to turn into a whole you know, tree thing, a, tr a tree data structure representing the non-deterministic options, then the leaves of those trees are the verbs. And so what you would be then saying is pass me one of the leaves and I will use that leaf to, to specify the entire path. And that would not be a node because the node is a part of the original compute model, not a part of the, it's like a part of the program model. And the program model wouldn't contain the extra information about procedurally which path we took to get there, right? We could have a single verb node with multiple ways to reach it. And if that happens, then which way we reached it matters because that's the one that tells us how to get back to the fork that we're actually using, right? Running backwards would be completely impossible. So the only way to figure it out would be to have that extra data structure that's the tree, and that's like gonna have to be something other than a node. So I think this should be like this. And so we'll think about how the user gets their hands on a verb later. But let's build let's build that. So I'm building my machine. 
and there's this new button where I tell it here's the verb to do, run. So the first thing is you should only be calling this when the machine is in the await mode. Right, you have to wait for it to be in the await mode. If you try to do select and you're not in the await mode, then then uh, we don't know what that means. Um, for now, I'll just do this. Probably later I want to not do all these asserts and instead have like a developer escape hatch that just says like, hey, something bad happened here. We gracefully moved forward, but uh, you know, keep an eye out on whatever this is. It looks broken. Um, but yeah, this is fine for now. So we're in the await mode, we get our verb. Then the next question is, how do we do the transition? Um, we could just save the verb and then say when we do a step afterwards, that's where the change happens. And let's think about pros and cons of that. The pro of that, the advantage to that is that I keep all of the logic that actually controls updating the machine in here. So this would then become like, um, if machine resolved verb does not equal zero, and then updates to the verb queue and the fork queue or whatever else needs to happen. Another another thing will probably show up here, which would be like the SM, I, I, I don't know what it would be exactly, but the for now it would probably be like, we just stick it into the fork select node pointer and then we set the mode to um, resolve or something like that, right? Resolve being the mode where you resolve the non-determinism Um, this sounds good to me. And so then this becomes resolve verb equals verb if we want. Okay, and then the SM verb resolve verb just hangs out there, part of the non-deterministic control flow. When we get that far, then what we're going to do is we're going to save the verb. I believe this has an assert for now. We're going to save the verb and we're going to go um, clear out all the verbs we know. We're done with these verbs now. Um, well, let's, yeah, well, this will happen at the end, but still the same main idea. So, uh, if machine verb q first is not equal zero, then the machine's verb q last. So we're transferring our q onto the free list. So we take the end of our queue and we have it point into the rest of the free list. And we take the free list and have it point onto the queue. And then we zero out the queue. So the queue gets zeroed out and the resolve verb gets zeroed out. So that clears out everything we know about the verbs from, from the last batch of non-deterministic control flow. These have already all been dequeued and put into the free list here. These kind of belong more up here, which reminds me. All of these need to constantly be getting updated. Probably want a better plan for how to separate the arena. So what I could do here, there's a simple trick, which is to pull out the arena pointer and the pop to value and then run the pop to memory 
zero the whole machine and then restore the arena and the pop to a little bit annoying when I have to do something like that, but I think that that's better than having to manually type in the zero for each of these. Um, the next step to making this even better would be to have a split where all of this is machine and this is outside the machine, so then I can just clear zero this correct section and not have to do this like pull it out, zero it all, put it back in. Um, but it's fine. It's fine. Okay, okay, so. So we were implementing the await mode. So if we have a resolve verb, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put uh, the machine into the mode called SM mode resolve. And when you're in the resolve mode, you're gonna start with your node on the resolve verbs fork select node. So this is the node that you start with. Whatever, you know, this might not be the verb node, but it's the, the first node on the path. And if you execute from there, then you should get back to where you started. We restore here. Yeah, the restore won't matter. Later, once this is a tree, we'll restore by looking at the, the data structure of the tree to do the right thing. We want to make sure that we do a, a restore back to the original fork. I think maybe the right thing to do actually is when we're in fork mode, we do our restores right here so we do a fork save and then for each verb or for each path we pop off the fork queue we do a restore and then we also do one for going into a wait mode this would be sort of this would become looking at the parent in the tree to restore to and this would become restoring to the root later Now, we're putting it into resolve mode. We are what are we doing with the? We're putting the node pointer at the beginning of the fork path. We're clearing out the verbs that we've got, putting them all into the um, memory management up here, and then. The next step, yeah, so we have an await. Do we have a resolve? No, we need to be able to print the resolve mode. And then um, yeah, that's good. And then the last question is can we run the resolve mode well resolve mode is going to look like non-deterministic mode so it's going to go along doing da 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 it shouldn't find any forks right now because we're executing paths that are in, supposed to be non-deterministic but it should be able to find a verb and so the mode here should be non-deterministic or resolve this time we're reaching a verb during resolve mode, so we don't do a, yes. So now what we have to do is we say, if the machine mode is non-deterministic, then when we reach a verb, it's doing this. On the other hand, when we're in the resolve mode and we reach a verb, it's just a 
it's just an empty node, kind of like how enter is just a node that tells you, okay, then move forward, right? In, in resolve mode, a verb is just where you get back into deterministic mode. And so that's the other thing we need to do is that transitions us back to deterministic mode. What's the problem? Oh, equals equals, got it. Uh, yes, okay. All right, so it goes, oh, well that's new and weird and bad. How did that happen? Um, I'm gonna guess that that happened because I forgot that the node pointer has to get set after this as well. Okay, so there's enter, show, fork, fork mode, thief, non-deterministic, fork mode, beast slayer, non-deterministic, fork mode, archeologist, non-deterministic, fork mode, await mode, and now we're stuck. Now we did all that work to get unstuck, but we're still stuck. And that's because even though the machine supports it, my interface doesn't. So the next step is now that the machine has done all this, how does the interface get its hand on the set of verb options. Well, for now, I'm just going to do the the um, the ugly option, which is to reach in directly um, and look at those verbs to do something with them. So let's take a look. The verb text. Yeah, this is where we might have to touch fancy strings too. So the verb text is coming into my interface state as a QU element, which is just a string but I'm actually gonna want multiple verbs now. And so, and I'm gonna to wanna to associate data to them. So, so, what I could do is I could say that the verbs will be a chain just like the elements are a chain and that they are gonna have an extra data attached to them now. So it'll be like this first verb, last verb, and if first verb does not equal zero, then what we do is a loop over all of the verbs, like this, and with each verb, we will have a paragraph. We will take the verbs text, and we won't have the hotkey on it, but we will use the machine verb function and we will set the first parameter to the verb data like that, right? So we set a parameter, we say we're gonna call this machine verb on this, on this alive piece of text. And now our paragraph I'm gonna have the paragraph spaced a little more tightly to each other at the level of the verbs. And maybe what we can do is just have a little fun here. We can go, what do you do right here? That won't always be appropriate, but we'll deal with we'll deal with that uh, later on. And I want to set the font right there to the italic font. Um, and I want to set the color right there to the question color. Now we need to implement the new payload function called the machine verb. And the machine verb is going to work by going app sm select param. Let's take a look at the payload struct v0. This is an SM verb. Uh, 
putter from int. And then it's going to app sm run. And if it's in debug mode, it'll sm debug as well. So the machine verb is just like this, except this is the ver the this is the the function that kicks off if we first need to select something before we run. So we do a selection by clicking that will tell us which verb to select. So the only remaining problem is when I create my verb, right now I'm assuming there's one of them. Um, what's actually gonna have to happen is that the, the run is gonna return a list of them. And so what we're gonna do is go, okay, first verb, last verb equals zero each. And then we're gonna look around the um, uh, we could go into the story machine. So here's what we could do. The story machine has the idea that when it runs, it returns a run result. Instead of giving verb text, it could give us the interface text here. I could be like ver like a chain where each member of the chain has the SM verb and the text together. And then that would come out here into the interface and just get copied. Or I could just scan the verb queue directly. I think I'm gonna do the second, the first option because I think that in the long run, that's the direction it's gonna go. Because what's gonna happen is that the, as there starts to be that those trees of options, what I do with different fork nodes along the way will become more and more interesting, right? That question part where I was like, what do you do, right? This question here, that's not always gonna be the correct prompt. So the fork might be the one that needs to tell us what the correct prompt is. Or there might need to be a prompt node that happens um, during a non-deterministic path or something. So a prompt would be not an endpoint, but a piece of data accumulated along the way. And then you can imagine the trees contain prompts within them so that I can get like a hierarchy of my verbs into my interface somehow, right? There's different ways we could do this, but if we're gonna be building a tree, I've already known that I'm imagining the interface having a hierarchy of verbs sometimes. And now we're finding that there's these ideas of a tree of verbs appearing in the computation model and the non-deterministic control flow. So that the lineup of tree on this side and tree on that side suggests to me that, that those, are, those ideas are starting to line up nicely. Um, but in order to present that, I can't just have you po poking into this data structure directly. I'm gonna wanna have the ability to say like, clean that up into the interface from the machine, right? The machines exporting the data is gonna want an extra step in between its internal state for con managing the control flow and its exported data. Um, I assume. It, I might be totally wrong. It might be that this data structure here is exactly what you want to walk, but I think it just feels a little better to it to, to plan on having another ex, another layer of processing that sort of projects the internal data structure to something nicer to send out. Um, so we'll call this a verb result, result verb. If we just call this the result run or run result, run result, verb, resu result verb, result present. Um, so the run result is the thing you get back from running or stepping. The verb within it is the I don't know, like the interface verb, something like that. It's a little bit of a long name, which is why I wasn't thrilled about it, but okay. Um, there's the verb of interest. And so now the interface verbs come out like this. We have our first verb, our last verb, our first last, our last verb. We can give it a verb count. So we'll fill that up from inside the machine. And then what we'll do is we'll have this becomes our interface verb um, like this. 
uh, this comes from the run dot first verb and um, and then using the same procedure we did here, we push these things on. The new elements text comes from the interface verbs uh, text and the interface state first verb. So the interface state contains the new element and the new element also now contains the data which is the interface verbs verb pointer. The verb pointer takes us to the thing where we want to end up. Okay. LSAT, how about last? Okay, so we don't have SM select. Let's get that in there. SM run. Good. SM select needs to take, I think it takes the SM verb directly, right? And that's going to want to be just go straight to the machine select. Um, and we'll take the app state SM machine. Let's give this a shot. Thief fork. Beast Slayer fork, archaeologist fork, await. Okay, we're close. Still nothing yet. Um, the reason there's nothing yet is because even though the interface is prepared to receive these verbs, we only half did the job on the machine side. On the machine side, I said that there would be a chain of verbs, but I haven't actually done that. So now what we need to do, is whenever we're stepping, if we find ourselves in the if we find ourselves, so here's where we update state. Now we need to start sending out results. And if after updating state, we end up in the await mode, then the machine is ready to generate some verbs. And so we'll generate those verbs by going over the verbs of the verb queue that is internal to the machine. And this is that spot where if I want to do an extra layer of transformation, I can on that text, right? So the verb I look at here is going to go into an SM interface verb, which I'm just going to push right onto the output arena because remember, these things take in an arena for allocating those run results, which we planned on all the way at the beginning and haven't had a chance to use yet. Here it is. We push the interface verb onto the results verb list. Verb first. Verb last, interface verb, result.verb count plus equals one, and then the interface verb text will push on to the arena as the um, copy of the verb, so when we create the verbs, the verb nodes in the graph, right? Over here in the graph, we have these verb nodes. I put the data right there. That's what I want the clickable part to be, um, sort of. So I think that's called data. Yep. And we just want to turn that 
into a string and copy it there. And the interface verbs verb pointer points back to the internal verb node like that. So if we're in the await mode, it'll just keep pr prompting saying like, please take one of these verbs, please take one of these verbs. It is not a member of SM verb. Okay, the verb is not the thing that contains the data. It's the verb node. So when we have a verb, what we have to do is we have to go SM node verb node equals the verbs verb node and then the verb node contains the data. So there we go. That's the extra step of processing that has to happen. The verb node on this verb right now, we then get its data, turn that into a string and save it onto the output arena and attach that to the internal verb pointer. The first verb should be the verb first. All right, now thief, fork, bee slayer, fork, archaeologist fork await and here we go I've got some I've got some verbs so I do have one mistake which is I need to make those non wrap uh, non wrapping I also keep feeling like this is like bigger than what I would like so let's try to make the text a little smaller and now when we're outputting a verb in addition to everything else when I put When I put down the verb text, mark it as no wrap. If you do, I am the thief. So we go, now we're in resolve no mode. We go to the thief node. We step forward, now we're in the wire in deterministic mode. And then we get to the exit. And that's where we get stuck, which makes sense. Okay, so just to recap, when I made this what I was thinking was you'd start here you'd go along now we're right now we're stepping through it one step at a time because we're in debug mode if we were in play mode you would immediately run and see the output from this you'd see this as a part of your log and then you'd see um, you'd press enter once probably you'd end up on this fork and it would gather up the verbs now we would need some kind of prompt right so we're thinking like maybe the fork actually goes into a prompt. Right, like this. And then the prompt instead of the fork would be the thing that would lead forward. So the prompt is just saying, uh, well, the problem with that is the fork needs to have the actual Okay, so maybe what we would do is say prompt fork um, show goes to prompt prompt goes to fork. How does that work out? This is a new twist onto the design I have not thought through yet. So the advantages to this are the fork needs to be the one at the lowest level of the compute model that actually contains all the outgoing paths, right? The fork is the node that says you can go here or here or here. So the prompt becomes, well, what's interesting about it is when we see a prompt as we're executing, it's not clear what we would do. Would we save that and remember that that's the prompt for the next set of verbs? And does that mean that multiple prompts don't nest? Or is the right idea to say the fork itself contains the prompt data? So you'd see this, you'd go, oh, we're at the fork, here's the prompt, and we look ahead to find all the verbs, I am this, I am this, I am this. And then if you wanted a hierarchy of prompts, right, so if you wanted no prompt, you would do this. If you wanted a hierarchy of prompts, you could imagine someday having like forks inside of forks. And 
this could be like Right, whatever. Right, it gets complicated and interesting and whatever, but um, yeah, maybe, not sure. Hey Abner, welcome. I was saying a little bit ago that I'm keeping an eye out um, to come hang out in your stream whenever. Um, so we're good to go on that front, but uh, I am gonna finish up what I'm in the middle of at the very least. Um, boop, boop. Okay, so not quite sure what I wanna do with prompts yet. Um, the issue of putting them, like I could put them after, right? So each of these would have, you know, you'd go fork and you have thief prompt. That doesn't really work because I don't want a separate prompt node for each one. Um, you could also imagine that this becomes like, whoops. I have no idea what you guys just saw. I somehow accidentally locked my computer. Anyway, um, you could imagine that this becomes like this maybe. So if I allow forks to flow into forks, then maybe what happens is you start a fork and the first fork creates the prompt. So prompts would still be required to be in non-deterministic mode, which makes more sense to me. Um, but you would say something like, who are you here, maybe? All right, and so now, the idea is now each of these would flow from fork two. I'd have to support forks inside of forks, but the idea is the prompt that you see here um, is one of the paths through this fork, and so it hierarchically contains all of the things that are downstream from it, and yeah, that seems that seems reasonable. So it's not a verb, but rather it's part of the like the the data structure that presents the verbs to the user. So internally, the tree would be shaped like here's a root, here's its child, and here are the cha ch here are the like grandchildren of the root, right? And then to the user, you would see here is a prompt and here are all the things contained underneath that prompt hierarchically. And so if you then wanted to, the prompt by itself, these could also be considered like, um, uh, well, it, it, I don't wanna have to spin up a whole example, but there are use cases where I wanna have like, what do you do? And then it's like, go to the tavern, dot, 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 and order a drink and order, you know, uh, and, and, pay, and pay for, a stool to, to eat on or whatever, right? Like there's options for what you can do at the tavern and you don't have to, like I'd like to have them all grouped together under a hierarchy there without having to make it super complicated how that relates to the low level control of the, uh, the non-deterministic virtual machine, right? So anyways, just exploring some ideas there. In the meantime, it kind of looks like we've got this doing what I would want, which is um, at the fork, it looks ahead to each verb, and then I select one, and then it runs through there. Something I haven't done here that we could try is I could flip the order. Layers are supposed to be allowed to go either way. So you could imagine something like the fork leads to the wire, the wire leads to the thief, the thief leads to the exit, right? Um, so this would go here, this would go here, and this would go here. The 
wire leads to the archaeologist. The fork leads to the wire. The archaeologist leads to the exit. And uh, wire, not not fork. Okay. And what's cool about that is when we reach fork, we go into fork mode. Then I go to a wire. I can see it go from the wire to the thief and then to the fork mode and then wire to the beast layer and then to the fork mode and then wire to the archeologist. Fork mode, await, await mode. I pick the thief and then it goes wire, thief, deterministic mode. Cool, okay. So that is huge progress. I feel like I'm finally actually making a, a machine that executes the way I need it to. Um, it's been a long journey trying to find something like this. I think this is starting to click pretty nicely. Um, like I said, this is a very low level way to construct these behaviors. And so I probably still need to spend some time building this out and then I need to come up with a higher level thing that I can project down to this lower level. But, but this has the right um, meat on the bones now. So, what do we do? We got a little bit of time left for today uh, to play around. I wanna think about what I can do with the last couple of, you know, last 30 minutes at most, maybe uh, maybe an hour. I don't know exactly how much time we have before, um, before we wanna be ready to wrap up so I can go hang out on Abner's stream. But, um, what are a couple of things that are coming up? Let me just go through that out loud right now to think it through. One thing that's coming up is these wire nodes need to actually be interpreted. So these ones become content that go to the screen. But um, this is supposed to be like a statement that executes, right? So what I would need is I would need, um, first of all, I would need in the story machine some way to store a variable. Remember we talked about this. It's where we put something like um, memory slash state, something like that. Um, so then what would have to happen is like, if there was gonna be a dictionary of like a scope or something, right? There could be like a SM scope, um, root scope. And so this right here would be like, oh, in the player character, look that up and play, look up that variable in the root scope. Oh, we found a variable for it. Equals key. Okay, look that up in the root scope. We found it. Dot thief. Oh, the key was that a scope? Oh, it is. And then grab the thief thing from that scope, and that's a value. Yeah. So we can assign that. Yes. And so we have to build a whole parser right here. We have an expression parser and uh, an evaluator with scoped variables. Um, and the idea is each wire would basically stand for uh, a single statement. So like in this case, an assignment. I would also say you could imagine this is where I would put a function call, although I might want a separate kind of node for that since I want function calls to be um, only allowed in deterministic mode. So you wouldn't be allowed to put them inside of the non-deterministic section that is introduced by a fork. Um, but at least assignments and you know you could imagine also things like hey um, cost plus e or um, uh, player dot money minus equals cost right you know item item dot cost right things like that so I want to be able to write stuff like that and so I would also need a story about like, how do I bind, how does it, how does it know about variables, right? So it might be that I need to be able to do something up here like decals, where I go like, okay, uh, there's gonna be a player character. There's gonna be a thing called key, right? Um, I might need a thing like uh, the init path that goes, um,
like this, and then like I could implement this as um, I could implement this as like a scripting environment. And so I would introduce new variables by just being like, to set them. You don't need to type them or declare them or anything. You just, the first time it gets set, it comes into existence. The advantage to that would be that since it's all these little tiny scripted, like tiny, tiny little script lines, like it's tiny little fragment statements everywhere. If I do it as like an, uh, high level scripting language kind of thing with a garbage collector and the, um, well, probably wouldn't need a garbage collector at least right very early on, but with the like, you know, dynamically typed, uh, uh, dynamically scoping or dynamically handling variable scopes and all that. If I did it that way, that would mean there doesn't need to be a comp compilation pass over the whole thing to make sense of it. So that could be good. Um, that's that's one direction I need to look at in more detail. Uh, another thing that I need to think about is right now I just have one graph here. And so if I'm going to have, uh, there's an entire feature that is missing from this that I probably need to talk about a little bit. So the there need to be subgraphs. And so first of all, I would need to be able to say when I am doing a specific graph. So that might need to be something like SM graph and then give it a name like main or whatever, right? So here's our main graph and here's its entrance. We pick a character and then when we, um, when we have our character, instead of going to exit, this thing would go to, um, we call it act one, let's say. And this can just be a, wire with no like no so uh, a, a no op can just be a wire with no statement attached that is a helpful thing to have because then i can do something like act one uh, wants to end path onto act one act one graph sub graph and then here I would put down the name of the subgraph, which would be, you know, like act one. And then over here we have to have the SM graph act one, right? So that's a direction I need to go, which is to be able to have these separate graphs. And the interesting thing is like here, I am now exposing some other limitations to the way I've declared the uh, machine structure or the, the program structure. So right now my paths just look like this. What I'm actually gonna need is I'm gonna need an idea of like a list of marks that live on a path. We can talk a little bit about what a mark would be, but this would mean I'd need to be able to do something like this and then go SM mark to mark the previous path or something and go like, okay, mark that with enter. Because when we go into a subgraph, we are gonna need to tell it the label for the enter node we want to use, right? And some graph, so act one might not be a good case of this, but if we kept going, you could imagine we'd get to a situation where we're, um, let's say that we're going to the dungeon graph, right? And so act one graph, we'll go to the dungeon graph and there are two ways into the dungeon graph maybe, right? So there's like, okay, you can get in from the, you can get in with the, the group, or you can, on another path, it's not through the act one, but it's through, maybe it's how you get there in act two graph, you go to the dungeon, but you go to the alone entrance, right? Something like that, right? And then if this was our dungeon, we'd have the group entrance, and the alone entrance. The point being there's two different sort of states that the beginning of a dungeon story can, can have. Um, you might enter into the dungeon multiple times throughout the game, and sometimes you're entering with a group and sometimes you're entering alone, and those turn out to be fairly different stories or whatever, right? 
it's kind of a strange example. I think better examples exist, but I do know I want stuff like this where I can have multiple entry points into the subgraphs. And then the marks on the paths tell it where to go. But the other piece is once we have a subgraph, the subgraph might have multiple exit nodes. So there could be like, okay, I act one, you can exit um, the join guild exit. So that's the end of act one, right? And you have the join guild or you've got the um, shady ally ending, right? So maybe you make a shady alliance to end act one. And so depending on which way you end act one, um, you would want, um, right, you could imagine that you want a, um, let's create a wire, um, how do I want to do this? Let's create an act. Let's just create the nodes for each act like this. This is the act one. And then there's act two. Um, good path. And there's act two evil path. or whatever and so then you want to be able to say okay okay there's a path from act one graph to the act two good graph and that bears the mark of the join guild and then there's a to the evil graph uh, from the shady ally right and so the point is, depending on how you exit from Act 1, we want to have the subgraph take a different path. And the marks um, that go into and out of subgraphs, the marks that go into and out of subgraphs are um, they're sort of supposed to type check up, or they're supposed to control flow check up with the subgraphs. So, here we would also want this, right? So up here we were saying, hey, if you got to the end of picking your character, we're gonna drop you into act one, and uh, we need to mark the path now as going into the enter node. And when we leave act one graph, we need to mark the path as uh, join guild or shady ally because those are for leaving, and we know, I think I my actual plan was to have like in marks and out marks, right? So the out mark tells us, um, like, hey, when we're leaving the act one graph, uh, I am the path that happens for this exit from the graph, and I am the path that happens for this exit from the graph, and then you can have an in mark, right? So you could have in mark enter because. Act two, good graph is also a subgraph. So you want two different kinds of marks. Marks that tell us what to do when we're exiting. One path between two subgraphs might need a mark for what to do, what, which, which exit from the outgoing or from the source graph and which entrance to use to the destination graph, right? Alternatively, you could imagine hooking it up like, like this. Once we've got it set up, you could say act, act two is just a single thing, but there's the, there's the, um, the join guild and the shady ally entry points that make it a little different to get started or something, right? Um, so the point being, the whole goal here is to be able to organize larger systems out of subgraphs, and then we need different mechanisms for ch um, composing them. And one easy one is to use a subgraph, where you take a node in a graph and say that that node is an entire graph inside of it. And so then the entrances and exits become important because edges flowing into the node that's a subgraph 
those are the ones that need to flow into an entrance of the subgraph and the exits from that subgraph flow back out into the containing graph, right? Um, so that's a direction I need to go. That includes organizing things into graphs and building up the marks that live on paths and then setting up this subgraph uh, system. And I also have to think about like, can subgraphs happen inside of a non-deterministic flow? I think the answer is no. So the reason that call and subgraph can't happen inside of non-deterministic flow is because an enter node should always be deterministic so that we can assume when we're doing analysis of a graph that this is a de deterministic mode always. And um, that doesn't mean that we will actually have to make it deterministic there. We might get around that by having something like the look ahead idea, right? Which is the idea that there's a transition out of out of the non-deterministic section of code into a deterministic section of code that is treated non-deterministically. But that still has a subtle difference. The, the, the difference when you are in a different type of code does matter a little bit um, for like organizational purposes uh, and and the like the purposes of, of um, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, if you had no way to sort of color your graph, so you had deterministic and non-deterministic sections, then if you have just one path that leaks out and doesn't have a verb to transition, that's a that's a um, an annoying enough problem that I want to have some way to ch catch that and stop it from happening. So I like to think of these graphs as being colored, black for deterministic and green for non-deterministic. And the black parts can actually be run in a speculative look ahead way, but certain things have to happen to go from green back to black, like you have to find a verb. Um, and so if you got into a subgraph after doing a look ahead, it would be because you invoked very specifically that rather than because you forgot a verb. Kind of inverting it into an opt-in to do the shady stuff or the, the, the dangerous stuff, the risky uh, stuff, something like that. Opting into the, to the things that are more likely to cause bugs rather than having to opt out of them. Um, Okay, so that's another thing I have to think about moving forward is the graphs, the subgraphs, the marks on the paths. Another thing I have to think about, so we talked about the statements on the wires. Another thing I have to think about is blocks. So I have verb. I probably want a thing called a block, which would actually be something we could implement right now. So let's try this. Let's imagine that in addition to everything else I have here, that I am, um, uh, that I have an unlockable fourth play mode. I don't know what I would call it. Um, you know, uh, uh, yeah. right. And uh, what I would do here is say, oh, um, let's put down the block type. And so the verb type, we'll just hide there. The block type wouldn't need any content attached to it. What a block will do, it's kind of like what a verb does. If it is reached, it should be reached during non-deterministic mode and it should take us back to fork mode uh, and clear that out. It does not push the verb onto the queue. So unlike the verb, which transitions us to, um, which saves the endpoint as a reachable verb, 
block just says, hey, we came down this path and we don't want to go this way. Like this is not allowed. This is a dead end. You can't come here. And so there's no way to select that once you're resolving to a deterministic option, which means resolution should never happen at, through a block, right? If everything works out correctly. And, um, and when we are checking, uh, we have to deal with the block now. And the block should have no outgoing paths. Blocks should be dead ends. So over here, if I do this, I should get, oh yeah, I was messing around, take that out. Okay, so the tourist has the wrong number of paths. Okay, the quest. The tourist has the wrong number of paths because the, a block shouldn't have anything outgoing here. So I call this the block. We'll do this and then we'll say, okay, now what happens? It works. So it looks at the thief. It looks at the thief slayer. It looks at the archeologist. Then it goes back. Now it's looking at a wire. It's looking at a block and so it's gone back to the fork mode and now it's giving me three verbs, not four, right? So there's our block node. That's an e easy one to get in there. Now block nodes might seem lame by themselves, but once I add in branching, a branch would be something that has two outgoing paths instead of one. So a branch would look kind of like a wire, except instead of, um, Except instead of a statement, this would be an expression that evaluates to like a truthy, falsy kind of thing. And we would say, okay, if this is true, then we'll go down the first path, which is hit this wire, go to the tourist, right? Branch goes to the wire, wire goes to the tourist, tourist goes to the exit. But if this is falsy, if this, does, if this evaluates down its false path, the branch will be something that has two different ways to go and then it'll get blocked, right? So it'll just, it'll block out that option. That's the plan. So let's, let's pencil that in the same way we did with the wire. So the branch is one with, that requires two outputs. And, and the branch um, executes for now, what we'll do is we'll say that the way the branch executes is we are going to look at, we're expecting two paths, right? So this is the path one and the path zero, uh, or like path, the true path and the false path, something like that, right? And what we will do is just take the false path for now. Once this can be evaluated, well, like once we can evaluate the expression living on a branch, then this could also take the true path, right? And um, and so now we go to the branch in non-deterministic mode. The branch takes us to the block, which takes us back out and we get three options, right? But if we were going down the true path, then we would get this far and we would get to the tourist node and boom, now we have this, right? So there's a part of the idea there is if I can write some code that, that wants to sometimes create a verb and sometimes create a dead end, now I'm new in non-deterministic code, I can end the non-deterministic code with a block, which means, um, uh, that this is an invalid path you cannot take. And I can end it with a verb which says, hey, this is a path and here's the end point of that path that you can resolve to. And so then things like branches and wires can be embedded along the way, which means that this can involve interesting computation to decide what verbs are actually possible. Um, 
which is cool. Okay. So there's the branch type node. So another kind of node that I could fit in here um, while I'm thinking of the simple stuff is if I'm gonna have in the non-deterministic case, I think that this whole idea of having a branch that goes to a block on its false path is gonna be pretty common. So what I will do is just make a higher level unit that does that in one step, so a gate. And the way a gate will work is it will also take an expression like a branch, but if it f goes true, it will move forward. And if it goes false, then it's just a block. So that'll let me save on having to wire that up. And so now instead of thinking it goes in, it branches, it blocks, it goes forward, you can just think it goes in, it goes to a gate. And if that gate fails, it's like, a, it's like it hit a block. Right, so a gate can be a block or it can be open. Um, and so uh, the implementation for the gate needs um, uh, that. It's that, the gate got a one there, right? And then this will just do the same thing a block would do. Gates should always be in non-deterministic mode. And then they act as a fork or they could act like this. Right, this would be their true path, and this is their false path. Um, gate goes back to the fork, and we get three of them. Okay, cool. So, to do um, burr, 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 burr. let me think if there are any other big big problems so there's the parser the variable system so I haven't talked about function calls yet I think that that would not be too interesting but I think yeah let me think about how that I could do that so a wire is gonna have basically an assignment type um, If I wanted to be able to do a function call, I wouldn't be allowed to do it here. Um, this one can be rearranged with the verb first and then the function call after. But um, you could imagine, for instance, something like and path enter init, which would be a call to the run init function or something like that, right? And so the question is, if I'm doing a call, what does that mean? I think this then means I have an entire scripting language outside of the graph thing. Like somewhere I have to have sm func run init or, or just like, I just have to have like a script. It's like function, run in it, boom, right? Um, boom, right, it starts, it starts to look like we're, we're talking about stuff like this, right?
right? If I'm gonna have stuff like this, that would make sense because then I could say like, okay, um, here's what a function call means. It looks like this, but it's a little bit strange. And the reason it's strange is because, the reason this is strange, there's a couple of reasons. One, it's strange because the rest of this, I'm specifying code as a graph. And then all of a sudden I'm specifying code as a procedural script thing. Um, so maybe the question is, can I think of the function call as a subgraph? But the other issue with that is my subgraph plan does not include parameters. So if I was gonna do, if I was going to do calls in subgraphs as the same thing, then I would need to fuse parameter passing and the subgraph control flow arrangements into one concept. So what that could look like is this, right? We would have a graph here called init, have a graph here called main. This would become a subgraph. Right. And what we could do is we could say the um, the subgraph does not always need marks on all of its paths. If there's only one entrance and one exit and there's one incoming path, one outgoing path that it can like infer the correct thing. So if we did that, then this could become more like um, this, right? So there's only one entrance node, so I don't need to tell it which one. There's only one exit node, so I don't need to tell it which one. And then it's annoying, but it's only annoying because I don't have a better high level data structure manipulator for this. But I could say like, okay, then once we've entered, start doing these wires that go like player money equals 30 plus Rand 10. Now you see, I still have a function call right there. That's where it's weird, right? So even if I did this entirely as graphs, right, it could all be graphs uh, up to here. And we, we say like, hey, this annoying thing about having to type in all my path, like wire paths in between these, that's just because I'm specifying this at a very low level of my machine um, program structure. And once I have a higher level data structure, an editor for that higher level data structure, I won't be bogged down in this. I will just compile down to that. But then the question is, what if I start seeing things like this, where it's like, oh, well, in the process of writing this, it felt very natural to say that what I was trying to do was to call a function. Can I do function calls inside of my expressions? Can my can, can that happen? Um, is that a subgraph too? Is there a subgraph called Rand that goes like this? Like I, I don't even know what you know. Um, whatever the PRNG shuffle rule is, like you like PRNG X or whatever shuffle, you could imagine you just put down the uh, whatever. Hey, Arturi, welcome. Right, so you could imagine that. Um, um, and then like, you know, 
if I kept going, do I want to specify everything this way? So the question is, that, I mean, that is the real question. Do I want to specify everything this way? R equals rand modulo n. So there becomes a question here of like, how did I p pass parameters into a graph? Can a graph have parameters? So this is like sm param n. So now when you call rand n, what you're doing is you're entering any, so any graph that has a single enter and a single exit can be a function call maybe. Um, how do we return? That is not set, so we'd have to have like sm node w1 result and then exit and path and path and path, right? Like, I don't know. This is strange, but it's like, it's, it makes sense that if I'm gonna have a unified com computation model that I probably wanna specify my functions in the same computation model as I specify my graphs. And so while this is a terrible way to, to write the code, I wouldn't wanna have to write the code this way. I would wanna be able to go like, hey, here's my scripting language. Function rand does the r equals prng and mask and PRNG state, all right, up here we have PRNG equals uh, get a seed or whatever, right? And then PRNG equals the PRNG shuffle, PRNG Right, you can imagine you want to be able to like write this complex stuff like this, like it's a programming language, and rand n. Uh, rand n would be like, you know, again doing stuff like this. Turn r local r but then the funny thing is say i'm writing my scripts like this and then they get compiled or translated into this thing here so they're each their own graph with just a sort of standard fully deterministic execution path um per usual rules of of uh programming procedurally translated into this. And then I have a weird situation where I also want those subgraphs, I, I want the exact same data structure to be a thing which I can enter from multiple locations. So it becomes like graph, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even specify the graphs textually. But like if I have a graph like act two does that have the ability to take parameters? Is a function able to say it has multiple entrance points like this? You know? Um, If a wire can do a function call on the function stack, then I think a function would have to be something. Yeah, the, the rules about um, where there can be deterministic and non-deterministic types of nodes might need to be relaxed to the point of being more flexible. And the reason I say that is this right now is still kind of cheating. I said I wanted to get all the way down to having um, the entire computation model in a unified 
um, uh, what's what I'm looking for, and like some kind of uh, like unified um, model that combines all the things at the same level, so there's not like separation. But here I'm still imagining separation. That's partly because the alternative here, right? If I don't, if I don't do separation, uh, let's 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 take out all the speculation stuff. If I didn't do expressions, if I didn't escape out to an, a scripting language right here, then the next step here that's more realistic is that we start doing something like this. Um, push L value player character push R value um, let's see how would I do this uh, right that's looking up an L value from the I'd have to go read my uh, crafting interpreters book again for some of the details on how he organizes the L value R value thing but something like push R value I think and then Right, so this would be the more truthful way to do it, where instead of calling it wire, each of the things here is now operating on um, essentially like in a machine stack. So we're we're starting with an empty machine stack, and then we go, okay, set up an L value, get the key, get the um, access the thief field off the key word object and then do an assignment on that. So the value that was here gets assigned into the L value that is here, something like that. And and like that might be the right thing to do because then it is a unified computation model. And if you then get to the point where you wanna do function calls again, so let me back up. This was just sort of speculation. But if you get to the point where you want to do um, well, yeah, like a, this right here, instead of subgraph So if you wanted to, then
Okay. And then let's see, this could be like, um, Okay, we want to run an, an init function now, and the init function needs to be set up like this. It would go like push. R value. Init. W1 flows to W2. Push our value player character W2 plus W3 call with one parameter. Right, so this is saying do a call node which means you pop two things off the value stack. So that would that would then tell it like, hey, your job is to pop one parameter off the stack and then pop the function off the stack. Call that function with this as the parameter. And and yeah, I have to figure out like that would just mean yeah, since 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 I'm fusing this all into one computation model, I think that would have to mean that the call stack is switching us to a different graph because the graph isn't just a story graph, it's also the model of computation. So the, the function should be implemented as one of these graphs. And so subgraphs and function calls are the same thing. Which means that when I say subgraph, act one and I have the incoming and outcoming edges what I might actually be saying is something like um, push our value act one push our value player character call but instead of call I might be saying Oh, this is where things get real weird. So having each of these as a separate node means that the way I flow through it is linear up to the, like the way I flow up to finding the call node is a single path. If I wanna have two different entrances into my graphs, then how do I ever, um, how do I ever realize that? Right, because the way that could make sense is if instead of joining here, for instance, each of these led to a different entrance of the next graph. It could be that instead of just saying, oh, mm, yeah, so I'm thinking it might be something like this. Um, so the tricky thing is if I don't have any parameters to pass along, right? If I have no parameters, it becomes trivial. Each of these, instead of ha instead of going into a join here, each of these just says like, oh, I'm going to go into act one, you know, dot thief entrance or whatever, right? R value thief subgraph, right? So the subgraph here is saying 
this is our subgraph and this is our entrance point, right? Subgraph, entrance point, subgraph kicks it off. If I wanted to, I could then sit that right here and say, okay, we've chosen thief. So we're going into act one, we're going to the thief entrance and begin the subgraph. And right there, as I enter into the subgraph, I can mark that as, right, I wouldn't even have to do this if I didn't want to, right? I could, I could attach the data to the edges. This is tricky. I'll have to spend more time thinking about this. I don't think I have time for it right now. Uh, because like I was uh, saying earlier, I am about to um, head over and hang out in Abner Coinbrae's stream. So that is um, Twitch TV Abner Coinbrae. Let me, uh, let me get this back into the state where it's building close panels. I'm going to go hang out at this stream here. I suppose I'll rate it before we before we are done. And uh, we're going to be just doing some stream testing for today. But uh, we're also going to be announcing a, an upcoming collaboration project. So if you want to catch the date for that, um, it might come out here or it might it might be that we don't announce it specifically today, but I'm not quite sure how that'll go. But um, that's where I'm headed. And besides that, um, thanks to everyone who came and hung out today. If you are interested in this project or in what I'm doing in general, uh, there's lots of information about it over at mrforth.com. I've got some open software projects you can take a look at. Uh, you can look at various video projects I've done. You can sign up for the newsletter to get updates once every month or two about big things going on. Um, at Mr. Forth, and uh, I stream on Mondays and Fridays. So, um, uh, if you're following me on Mondays, we do stuff with the Story Engine. I work on my big projects, and on Fridays we do whatever I think will be fun. Lately, I've been hacking away at a SAT solver, uh, but I have a lot of other ideas of what I might do on Fridays. Uh, so you never really know what that'll be. Uh, anyway, thanks for coming and hanging out. This was this was great, and I will. See y'all around the internet.